Giants open up with? They open up with the L.A. Dodgers. They open up with the San Diego Padres. Oh, yeah. Uh, we're all good. It's all there for the taking. He wasn't talking about the Cardinals there. Unfortunately, he was talking about the San Francisco Giants. That was MLB Network Radio this morning reacting to the news overnight that Blake Snell has signed a one year, essentially, contract worth $30 million alongside Alex Ferrario and Tanner Hendrickson. I'm Brandon Kiley. He signed the same kind of deal that we've seen the other Boris clients sign. It's a two year deal, technically, worth $62 million, and there's an opt out after year one. The expectation is if Blake Snell pitches to, you know, even just a solid degree, a, a reasonable expectation this year, he's going to get back on the market this upcoming offseason, and he's going to get paid maybe not in a huge way, but it's certainly better way than what he got this offseason. He had to settle for a one-year deal, essentially. Nobody expected that going into the offseason. Alex, this is the exact kind of deal that I was hoping the Cardinals would be in on early in the offseason. If you had told me in early November – Hey, Blake Snell's going to sign for two years and $62 million. Is that something the Cardinals should or could do? My answer would be an objectively, absolutely. Like, you got to find a way to make that deal happen. I think this could go down as the best deal of the offseason. I think there's a pretty good chance of that, actually. Signed the bleep in National League Cy, or won the, the Cy Young Award last year and gets a one-year guaranteed contract? That's crazy. Absolute insanity by the rest of Major League Baseball. They were all sleeping and suddenly he gets this pillow deal. I understand, though, why the Cardinals didn't do it. This is not me caping for them. I think they should have. The reason why you don't, if you're the Cardinals, is for one reason and one reason alone. It's three letters. C-B-T. That is why Wait, the Cardinals did not sign Blake Snell. If they had signed him... BD-3. <laughs> Basically, yes. L if the Cardinals had signed Blake Snell, they would have gone over the competitive balance tax threshold, which means that they are now paying into the tax, which they have said, we will never do. We are not in that spot as an organization. Now, we can have a discussion about it if they should have been willing to for a one-year deal where, hey, yeah, extend yourselves a little bit, Cardinals. You got a bunch of money coming off of the books after this upcoming season. You got a lot of pivots you could make. Hell, if it doesn't work out with Blake Snell, you're not even going to pay him that whole contract because you're going to trade him at the deadline. Alex, I'm frustrated today because this should have been the tell. exact kind of deal that the Cardinals were interested in early in the offseason. It wasn't available to them then, but they left themselves such little flexibility now that they couldn't, in their mind, sign him. What would you make of the deal last night? And this is why I said LGM for Lynn Gibson and Matt Carpenter. That's why you didn't get Blake uh. Snell. Oh, so you guys need to think a little bit more. I wasn't thinking let's go Mets. It's frustrating when you see a guy that you know would have taken your team from, yeah, maybe you can win the NL Central to, wow, they are the NL Central favorite signed for a one-year deal at $30 million. It's frustrating because this is what I've talked about and why I voiced the frustration in the past that people call me so negative about the Cardinals. The Giants said, well, if this guy's going to be here, bleep it. Let's go out and get him so that we can at least be in the conversation for a playoff. Now their three-headed monster is Webb, Snell, and Robbie Ray. And that's a team that you look at and you say, damn, that's going to be tough to go up against, even if other areas don't work. And for the Cardinals to just sit back and say, Meh, no, it just doesn't make sense for us. And I understand you've got the competitive tax threshold. You're going to be paying more money. But you knew that this guy wasn't signing right away in the early portion of the offseason. Like you, you, you have these conversations with teams to find out and gauge the interest of where are you going with this one? What's the market look like? What do you think Blake Snell's going to get? And the longer this took, the longer you sat on your hands and said, well, no, we can't afford to pay this one. It's, it's, it's frustrating for a Cardinals because now, and it's not just the NL Central. Like, sure, you can go up against the Cubs and the Reds and the Brewers, and maybe you come out on top. But none of that matters. It's going to be the same way it's been in the past, where you look at it and you say you get into the playoffs, but you're not doing anything. When you look at the Braves, the Phillies, the Dodgers, the Padres, and now the Giants specifically with their rotation, and you have Gray, Michaelis, and hopefully Mats as your one, two, three. That's that's not the same thing as these other National League contenders that say we're World Series aspirations. T-Bone's been the Blake Snell guy all offseason. I have to imagine this was frustrating for you. Somebody on the text on, line, by the way, asks from the 314, BK, why are you upset? A couple of months ago when T-Bone was all in on getting Blake Snell, you were against it. You were talking about how he doesn't pitch enough innings. You were so high on Aaron Nola, and then you spent two months every day talking 
talking about him. Now all of a sudden you're a fan and you're disappointed in them not signing Blake Snell. You flip flop on the Cardinals too. You flip flop on everything, man, except trading Barbashev. It's weird. <laughs> I was right on that. Um, sure you were. I, f I don't flip flop on players. I flip flop when the asking price changes, and I think that's a pretty reasonable thing to do. If you're telling me Blake Snell is going to get a five year contract at 125 million dollars, I think there's a lot of risk involved in that. I don't know what the end of that contract is going to look like. And so if it's Blake Snell for five years at market value or Aaron Nola at five years in market value, I'd rather have the Aaron Nola side of things because there's less risk involved. Agreed. Now, there's also less upside, but there's less risk. And I'll go that uh, that route whenever it comes to the pitching side of things. Now, position players, I typically go upside pitchers. I'm taking the lack of downside. <clears throat> this is effectively a one year contract that changes everything in the discussion. Right. If I'm getting a one year upside play, man, whether it comes to like if this offseason suddenly Josh Hader was still available right now and he's willing to take a one year, 20 million dollar contract. Guys, I would have been shouting from the mountaintops for the Cardinals to go make that move because it's a one year deal. Of course, the Cardinals should be in on something like that. Five years and one hundred million dollars. No, no please do not sign that contract. So it's all about. What are you willing to spend, right? What, what are you willing to spend for the asset that you're going to be going out to get? The asking price changed, and so my interest level changed. If you're going out and buying a car, Alex, there's different. You're going to probably buy a van at some point, right? Oh, yeah. You got 27 kids at home. I can't can fit three into the tiny one. There's only so many cars that you can go out there and get. Well, you might be looking at a bunch of different options for you. And if one's 40000 and the other is $20,000, you might like the $40,000 van a little better. But is it, is it enough to double the price for you? I, I don't know. That's basically what we're doing here with these pitchers. Blake Snell's asking price came down. The years came down. I would have been fine with them doing this. The reason why they didn't, though, the CBT. All right, now to T-Bone, who is furious today. Yeah, I'm livid. livid. I, a five-year deal, I probably wouldn't have done that for Blake Snell. But his market never came came to what he was looking for. Like, the Yankees offered $150 million, and this guy said no not that long ago. The reason I'm upset is it's twofold. One, I'm upset at ownership for not being willing to go to the collective bargaining tax when there's six teams in the National League that continue to push you down in the pecking order, might I add. Now the Cardinals, who were in that muddy middle second tier, are like looking up at the rest of the second tier right now. The Padres have gotten a lot better with the Dylan Cease acquisition. The San Francisco Giants have gotten a lot better because the Boris clients, they actually said, oh, hey, they're not getting big contracts. We'll jump into those waters and we'll go above and beyond for the collective bargaining tax. We'll go get Matt Chapman and Blake Snell. Guys, the Cardinals rotation does not stack up to the rest of these NL playoff contenders. I look at this last night. You got the Braves, the Phillies, the Diamondbacks, the Dodgers, the Padres, and now add into this mix the San Francisco Giants that have better rotations than the St. Louis Cardinals. Now, notice I didn't say anybody in the NL Central because this division sucks. <laughs> And it shouldn't be the thing you're building for. Well, we can make the playoffs. And now, the reason I'm upset at Mo isn't because Mo didn't go out there and go say, let's go sign Blake Snell. I'm sure that Mo would love Blake Snell. The problem is ownership said, here's where you can spend. And then he said, okay, instead of like waiting and being afraid to potentially be without a dance partner, which they had to jump the market again, which guess what? It bit him in the ass like it has before. <laughs> Damn, man. He said, let's go sign Kyle Gibson and let's go get Lance Lynn and let's let's have Miles Michaelis as our two. Now, look, I like the Sunny Gray signing. I like what they did with the bullpen. And we need leadership with Carpenter and Crawford. So that's the other thing. For the Cardinals to be able to make a deal like this work under the CBT, because people, I, I always like to be solution oriented, Alex. If we, saw, if, we, if we present a problem, let's also present a solution. Okay, BK, you say they couldn't have signed Blake Snell because of the CBT. Well, then they never could have made this work. Eh, kind of. They're about 15 to $17 million under the CBT threshold right now. And somebody on the text line, by the way, brought up that there's a, a signing bonus that is to be paid in 2026 in this deal. That's true. I don't want to get into some of the semantics, but basically the way that it works, it all accounts for this year in terms of the money. It's kind of like a football cap hit where it, Money can be moved around, but ultimately it's the cash that a lot of owners care about. In this scenario, the CBT is what matters, and it, it's based on the AAV. A lot of acronyms here. <laughs> Long story short, they were going to have to account for $31 million this year, and that's too much for them to be able to get under the CBT threshold, which they care about immensely. So how could they have done that? 
you could have traded Steven Matz if somebody's willing to take him. And guys, I don't know if you've seen, but there's a lot of teams out there that really need starting pitching right now. And Steven Matz, while frustrating, is absolutely worth his $11 million salary to another team if you wanted to move it off of your books. <clears throat> so that would be one way to move some money. The other thing, though, is even with moving Steven Matz, you still have to have a little bit more wiggle room under the CBT. You probably couldn't have signed one of Matt Carpenter or Brandon Crawford. So that would be oh, the move. Oh, no. You have to replace Steven Matz with Blake Snell. I think we're all pretty okay with that. Well, your leadership's not good, And you'd though. have to remove one of the veterans from your roster position player-wise. Then you could probably make it work when it comes to the CBT. You also then have almost zero flexibility in season. So these are the things that you have to be okay with. Like, you're getting something here. You have to give something there. I would have done it. I, when I look back at this offseason, I want to get this on the record so that way we could reference it during the season if and when things go awry. Get the lower third ready, T-Bone. The moves that I would have made that the Cardinals did not. I would have done what we just said to make it work with Blake Snell on this essentially one-year contract. I would have probably made the move for Robbie Ray, who is not going to be ready until midseason, but I think that's worth the upside play. That probably also would have meant trading Steven Matz. I would have been okay with that. Just put Zach Thompson as your number five starter. Ipso facto, you're basically even when it comes to the money. I would have made the move for Chris Sale that the Atlanta Braves did. That would have required you to send off a position player. I don't know who exactly, potentially Thomas and JC. They might have wanted somebody though on your major league roster. Either way, I'm making that move for Chris Sale. The other one I probably would have been forced into is Dylan Cease. If you're looking at, okay, if you were to order these, which one would you want them to make one through four? Because those are the four moves I think they missed out on the most this offseason. Number one, Chris Sale. That would have been my top priority this offseason. I said at the time, I still believe it today. You missed out there. Number two, Blake Snell, because it doesn't require you to give up significant assets other than the draft pick compensation. And you already gave up the second round pick because of Sonny Gray. Number three, Robbie Ray. Number four, Dylan Cease. That's how I would have ordered him. Alex, when you look back at the offseason, what do you think the Cardinals missed out on? I think those are the main ones. I, I would say that Dylan Cease is the one they missed out on the most. And, and I know when you saw the prices, you're like, man, would that have costed you? I don't really care uh, because you're getting a established major league pitcher that for the next two years. Uh, the other one that I would throw in there, and I don't know what he's going to sign for, but I, I would also sign Jordan Montgomery for whatever he signs for. Because I, I think that's one they probably could make under yeah, the CBT work. I, I, I think he's going to sign for something We've that got five starters. Yeah, exactly. But that's you'd have to trade Matts. No, no. Flat, <laughs> you want me to be creative and do something? No, yeah. we like to operate like it's 2004. Yeah, the yeah. Braves all off season. All right, move money here to get money there. Like move money there this off season. Season. But yet <laughs> like, the other right. thing we hear the Cardinals say all the time is, "Oh, we well, can never have enough money pitchers for other teams." <laughs> I just uh, whatever Montgomery signs for, I'm going to look at that and say, "Yeah, you should have signed that one too." So, but uh, I mean, we've seen. Multiple multiple pitchers for an offseason that we weren't sure if we were going to see a lot of movement in terms of trades with guys or signings there are a ton of guys that the cardinals are going to look back on by the trade deadline when they see what the cost is for a top pitcher or somebody that's in that conversation that they're going to say man all we needed to do was sign x or trade this and get that guy and now you're going to be left upstream without a paddle it'd be amazing if they traded for blake snell at the deadline that would be just chef's kiss giving up a ton that, of yeah. assets to be able to sign the guy they just should have signed now wow. that would be well, they'll, Perfect. They'll he doesn't want to be. They here. won't give up assets. Okay. Um, I I would say Snell's the number one one for me, because I and I would even be willing to go an alternative route to where I still had Mats in the rotation and I just don't sign Lynn and Gibson and I figure out the number five spot with you know Zach Thompson, Matthew Libertor, Drew Rahm, Michael McGreevy and just have this continual rotating cast of characters till either a somebody gets that job or b you can always find a number five starter on the market like the cardinals have done the last three trade deadlines so i would have gotten the blake snell route and this team is so worried because of the one-year deals have been handed out about having a potential out for next year and go into a retool guess what that's the blake snell deal you can, Blake Snell could opt out. If they are not good, he would probably opt out. If he pitches well, he would opt out. Hell, if he pitches well and you know it's going bad, guess what? You could trade him as well. I think there are very few scenarios in which he does not opt out after the season because he will not be att attached to a comp pick next year because he's opting out of a contract. He will be back on the market in a year in which maybe the market situation is a little different with the TV contracts being more settled. 
Like, unless there's a significant injury this year, there's a pretty decent chance Snell will be able to lock in more long-term security next offseason than a one-year $31 million contract. So it'd be pretty surprising to me if he does not opt out, no matter what, after this season, um, even if it's a quote-unquote down year for him because he's still got the same upside that was baked in going into this offseason. And I've said I haven't had an issue with the way that the Cardinals spend money because I, they're 11th currently in Major League Baseball. They're fine. That's fine. Their spending's like, okay. And, and though I would still have liked to have seen ownership say, hey, let's flirt with that CBT. You know, let's get a little frisky this mm. year instead of preparing to, like, just house and to plan on a retool next year. Let's actually play for a ceiling this year and actually be competitive in the playoffs and not just be bouncing playing golf in mid-October. But my biggest issue is the fact that they have a decent payroll. I mean, they have spent $185 million around 215 of the luxury tax this year. It's the way that they allocate money that just doesn't make sense. The way that Mo wants to divvy it up instead of saying, let's go like one big splash. It's like a number two. Let's go like have hey, a number five, a number five here. Oh, two bench guys that are like leaders. So then we're never going to see play. And then they did the bullpen additions. Like it, the way they just allocate the resources is what frustrates me the most. You mad, bro? I am mad. We've heard a squeaky voice seven times in the first segment, and we are 14 minutes we in. We suck. You need to calm down over there. No. That's Tanner Hendrickson. He's Alex well, Ferrario. I'm Brandon Kylie. You've got BK and Ferrario here on 101 That's ESPN. And Alex feeling a little under the weather today. This is his flu game. I told him to be one more uh, mic down for me. He did not listen to me. He is already refusing instructions, so I don't appreciate anything about the way that the first segment has gone. We want to hear from you. 314-399-9646 is the Air Comfort Service text line. You guys can always get involved over on YouTube as well at youtube.com slash 101 ESPN STL. Coming up next... What would it take for blue skeptics like T-Bone to buy into this team? Not as a, you know, Stanley Cup contender, but as a team that can actually make a run into the postseason. It starts tonight. Is one game enough, though? We'll talk about it next year on 101 ESPN. Alex Ferrario back with you to talk about my dentist 100 West Dental. Dr. Pryor and his team are the best when it comes to going to a dentist and takes the anxiety away, takes the nerves away for somebody who has had plenty of those uh, because of one bad dentist. And look, everybody, you might not even know if you've got a bad dentist, but I'll just paint the picture of what I had for the longest time. You go in, you sit down, they do the cleaning, the dentist walks in, open up, no cavities, good to go. We'll see you in six months. That's not preventative care. Now, what Dr. Pryor and his team do is preventative care because they're checking out everything in terms of early detection, making sure your teeth are strong, making sure your gums are okay, there's no bleeding when you floss, making sure your tongue's okay so that in the long run, you and your oral care are in the best shape. And that's why I love going to Dr. Pryor, have been going to them, and I don't have that anxiety when it comes to the dentist. And if you don't have insurance, they've got an opportunity that can help you out to where you will also also be able to uh, use utilize some of their insurance funds available before the end of the year. So make sure you get in to Dr. Pryor and his team at 100 West Dental. Check it out online, 100westdental.com. Get with the best at 100 West.
Alongside Alex and T-Bone on BK, the Blues back in action tonight. Your home of the Blues is right here on 101 ESPN. Alex will have your pregame coverage against the Avs coming up tonight at 6 o'clock. Alex, this is a big game. Un like, no doubt about it, a huge game for the Blues. The two longest winning streaks in the yeah. NHL right now are on the line tonight at Enterprise Center with the Avs coming here to St. Louis against the Blues. Now... T-Bone is our resident Blues skeptic. He hates this team. He thinks they're new, no good. It's him and Ben Hockman who wrote today, that hater, I'm in the St. Louis ben. Post-Dispatch. Your Blues are not good enough to make it to the postseason. It's just trash. Meanwhile, Alex and I, the real Blues heroes, are talking about how this team has what it takes. Because everybody else in the West stinks, basically. Very true. Especially the teams. The Blues and more about the wild card. Especially the teams that are trying to hold on to that bottom wild card spot. Alex, I don't think there's really anything to me that the team can prove tonight that would sway me one direction or the other, honestly. Will I feel better if they win tonight? Yeah. And will I probably celebrate it tomorrow in a way where it makes everybody in our audience annoyed? Absolutely. That's 100% totally. true. But totally. I don't think anything really changes tonight. T-Bone, we'll start with you. What would sway you? Oh, I don't think go. it's one game, but what would it take for you to be like, you know what? All right. Even if I'm not all the way in, I'm willing to explore the notion that this is a playoff. Easy game. on the high pitch voice here, okay? Well, I'm not upset about this team because I just have realized that this team's not doing much if they even get into the playoffs. Um, I I would say it's probably win three of the next four, four of the next five. I want to see more consistency, and I know that they've won four games in a row. And look, there have been some impressive wins in there. Like beating Boston was really impressive. Granted, I think Boston just overlooked you that night, and hey, they took advantage of it. Good for the St. Louis Blues. To me, it's can you beat Colorado, a team that is going to be a playoff team that is second, could win the Central, in fact. They're tied with Winnipeg coming into tonight's game. And then can you avoid laying eggs? Because I view Ottawa, Minnesota, Calgary, who's after the Vegas game, as three games that, like, you, I would say you should win those games. I know that they're close in the standings with you. I think you're arguably better than those three teams. Agreed. You cannot lay an egg against them. And the whole reason that I'm skeptical of this Blues team isn't about – do they play well against the Avalanche? Will they be able to beat the Vegas Golden Knights who added everybody at the trade deadline? It's more about will you show up in games that are uh, games that this season have been taken for granted? I can go back to like the Nashville game where it should have been like, hey, this team should be fired up. It's a playoff game. Lay an egg. Columbus, that team's the worst team in the Eastern Conference. You should be able to beat them. Lay an egg. San Jose Sharks, worst team in the Western Conference. Lay an egg. That's the same team. It's not like there's been new additions from the deadline. It's not like they traded guys out. This is literally the same team from those games that I just talked about. So can you play competitive hockey in for the next five, find a way to get one win over either Colorado or Vegas probably for me, and then take care of business at Ottawa, at Minnesota, home against Calgary? It can't be one or the other. It has to be against Vegas. If you're, yeah, you have to beat Vegas. If you're going to make the playoffs this year, you have to win that game if, against Vegas. If, that is a true must win yeah, in my opinion. If you lose to Vegas, you're putting yourself six points out of that spot, depending on what happens between now and then. That's the four point swings. You can't afford to lose that game, and you can't afford to lose the game against Nashville. Yeah, th those are the two, and really the Vegas one I would hone in on because it's Vegas and LA that you're competing against essentially yeah. now for the playoff spot. You got to win that game against Vegas. I. You can get one mulligan in your next three games. Could be tonight, could be against one of Ottawa or Minnesota. I would prefer not, obviously. Like, the best-case scenario, they go into that game against Vegas with a seven-game winning streak on the line. Yeah. That'd be great. But because you beat Boston, because you beat Minnesota, because you beat L.A., Anaheim was a needed win there. You, you have one mulligan in your next three games, and it can be tonight against Colorado. Now, this is a really good team. But you cannot lose that game against Vegas. To me... If you're a skeptic, there is more than enough information for you to be that. I understand it completely. I've been that for most of the season. But if they go 3-1 and one in their next four, I think that's when you probably have to start seriously considering the possibility that this is going to be a playoff team, and that three wins has to include one head-to-head -head yeah. against Vegas. It's when you've played these teams that you're fighting with. When you played the L.A. Kings, we looked at that as a must-win because if you can't beat L.A., well, then you don't deserve to be in the playoffs Agreed. because that's a playoff team. When you played Minnesota, now, you let them come back in it, but you still got the two points. That's the team that's chasing you for that playoff spot. And if they you played well in that game. Yeah, if you can't beat them, then you don't deserve to be in the playoffs. So if you lose to Colorado tonight as long as it's competitive look that probably was going to happen that team you've won twice against them in the last two years so it hasn't gone your way but if you stay competitive if your goaltender keeps you in that hockey game cool you look at that and you say ah, well you know what that's going to happen and that's my biggest thing on the whole mulligan thing if we're going to say they they get a mulligan okay 
I want to clarify what that mulligan is. It cannot be a mulligan of, hey, they didn't show up for a game. Like, they don't show up against Ottawa and they don't skate. To me, that's unexcusable. And the reason I say that is, guys, it's crunch time. This is what's going to define if you're a playoff team. We are fi- we're in the right. home stretch. You're in you're in the home stretch. You're yeah. you're at least able to say we're playing for this a playoff, is playoff spot. mode. There is no oh well we just did, you know we didn't come out tonight. We didn't skate in the first. Like that's inexcusable at this time of the year. And that's where I would say like the mulligan for me is okay if you play well against Minnesota, but Minnesota like Mark Andre Fleury stands on his head, which he kind of did last weekend. He plays really well, and you end up losing that game like one nothing, and Mark Andre Fleury just beats you. Okay, there you go. That's my mulligan. So you don't skate in that game, you don't show up. That's inexcusable this time. After of thinking year. about it more, I actually think the two games Saturday and Monday are the two most important out of their next five. Oh five. Uh, yeah, Minnesota's one point behind you those right now. Those are the two. You got to get those. Mm-hmm. Your mulligan is one of the next two. These are the two games that you can play with: is against Colorado at home, and then on the road against Ottawa. I, I would. They're going with Benner tonight. I would go with Huso. Hofer, God, come on, guys. I knew the moment that I he's said it. Better than no, Huso. I no, he's That's not. Huso's going to lose. I would go with Hofer on Thursday against Ottawa. And then I'm going Benner against Minnesota and against Vegas. Yeah, and and I would even go even more specific with it. I think the mulligan is Colorado. I think if you lose tonight, I look at it and I say they're the better team, and you knew that, and you just didn't have a good game. If you lose versus Ottawa... That's going to be a game I look at and say, well, you didn't show up for that team. That, that's fair point. That's kind of the Anaheim Ducks game. That and look, I, this I think this is the least important game for the Blues in the next three weeks. Yeah, because then you've got the this Calgary, tonight. you've got Nashville, you've got Edmonton. Like you've got a lot of playoff caliber teams. But if you lose against Ottawa. That means you weren't ready for Ottawa, which is a problem because it, remember when we talked about it in the bubble where they played so bad in those playing games and we said, man, you can't just flip a switch. Yeah. You got to get into the gears and you didn't. If you lay an egg tonight, if you don't skate with them or if Bennington has a bad game, which isn't going to happen, you look at it and you say, cool, Colorado's a great team. If you do that versus Ottawa, I, I don't know if I can – rationalize that the same way I couldn't rationalize Anaheim or San Jose or Columbus. Yeah, Minnesota right behind you. Vegas right in front of you. Calgary's a team you got to beat. Yeah. San Jose team you got to beat. San Jose again team you got to beat. Anaheim got to beat. Chicago got to beat. The only other games that we've that I have not mentioned coming up over the next two and a half weeks, three weeks, Colorado. Yeah. Edmonton. Mm-hmm. And Nashville. Yeah. And if Those you do the three games that you have to quote unquote play with, you probably got to go at least one and two. It'd be nice if you got at least three points out of those three games. That's probably where you're at right and, now. And that's what we talked about when we did this whole math of looking at it saying like 10, six and one was to get to a point total that could get you into the playoffs. Well, now we're talking about, you know, 13, three and one, if we're talking about three losses and I don't think you're going to go on that long of a winning streak, but you can lay an egg versus a top team. You can't lay an egg against a team that you should be picking up two points. And if you do lay that egg, well, then I think the skeptics jump right back on board and say, see, this is why we weren't believing them. He's Alex Ferrario. That's Tanner Hendrickson. And I'm Brandon Kylie blues versus the the Avs tonight. Pre-game coverage with Alex begins at 6 o'clock. That's all right here on your home of the Blues, 101 ESPN. In 15 minutes, we'll get to questions and answers. 314-399-9646 is the Air Comfort Service text line. But next, there's a lot of discourse today on the internet about have teams changed their development plans for quarterbacks? Why is it that so many quarterbacks from the 2021 and 2022 draft classes have already failed? I don't think it's anything new in terms of the quarterback development. I think it's new in terms of the way that we're treating them early in their career. I'll explain that difference next here on 101 ESPN. With Alex Ferrario, I'm Brandon Kylie For our friends over at Green Envy Lawn Care, Alex, I love this time of the year. It's starting to get nice outside. You're going for walks. I've got my baby boy. We go for a walk on the daily. And as you're walking, you start looking. 
And you look at all the lawns that you're walking past, and let's be honest, the first thing you do is judge. You say, okay, that's the best lawn in the neighborhood. The way to be on that list is to call Green Envy Lawn Care. They'll get you looking right in your front yard. It is the first thing that people see as they walk by your house. You don't have to be out there putting in all the work anymore. No, Green Envy will have the work taken care of for you. When I purchased my house, the I was that house that BK was talking about. I had yellow patches everywhere. It wasn't growing. I had weeds growing out. And now I'm the green grass that I feel like I am uh, the envy of the neighborhood. And look, it's because of the work that those licensed technicians put in. They're certified by the Missouri Department of Agriculture, which means they know Missouri's soil, weather conditions, turf types, and they know how to to get the best product out of your grass. Give them a call today. They're open 12 hours a day, Monday through Friday, Saturday from 9 to 1. Tell them Alex Ferrario and BK sent you 636-757-1600. That's Green Envy at 636-757-1600. Terry Hendricks here with a Sports Center update, driven by Johnny Londoff Chevrolet and Johnny Londoff Autoplex. Blues back in action tonight as they take on the Colorado Avalanche. We'll have pregame coverage starting at 6 o'clock with Alex Ferrario and Joey Vitale. Then Joey will join Chris Kerber for puck drop at 7. And the Cardinals back in spring training action today. They've got a split squad doubleheader. They'll take on the Miami Marlins, where Kyle Gibson will get the start. And then tonight at 5:10, they'll take on the New York Mets. And Lance Lynn will get the start. The Major League Baseball season officially gets underway tomorrow morning, 5:05 a a.m. in Korea. You will see the Dodgers take on the Padres. Tyler Glass now versus U Darvish. The Sports Home is driven by Johnny Londo. Find your road shop 24-7 at Londoff.com. Londoff.com. Are you kidding me?
All right, alongside Alex and T-Bone on BK, let's dive into some NFL quick hitters. Alex, earlier today over on Twitter, one of, I, I think one of the better uh, NFL minds out there, Bucky Brooks brought up the notion that NFL teams are now looking at the quarterback position in what he deems to be like the wrong way. He thinks that there has never been worse development at the quarterback position than there is right now. And the reason why, from 2021 to 2022, there were 19 quarterbacks selected. Two of those 19 quarterbacks are expected to start for the team that selected them this year in week one. It's Trevor Lawrence and Brock Purdy. Trevor Lawrence was the first pick in 2021. Brock Purdy was the last pick in 2022. Every other quarterback is either now a backup or has been traded slash released and will be on a new team. Alex, I'm curious your thoughts on this. Do you think that there has actually been a change or it's worse in terms of the development of quarterbacks? Because I do not. I think that what's changed is the way that teams operate now. And I think it's twofold. One, the rookie salary scale has changed a lot. You can move on from your mistakes quicker than you used to be able to. You think about it 20 years ago, guys. Hell, 15 years ago, think about Sam Bradford. If the Rams had admitted early on that it was a mistake with Sam Bradford, they would have been cutting a guy that was making $75 million in a time when that was big time money in the NFL because number one overall picks were making crazy amounts of money. Now, if you take a guy at number one, he's making like 10 million bucks over each of the first four seasons of his NFL career. You can move on from him like that it's no big deal we saw trey lance it was like two years in and they're like yeah this is a mistake we messed up we got to go a, new, a different route trade him so i think that's a big part of it i think the other part of it is teams are looking for a top 10 quarterback in a way that they didn't previously i think teams used to be okay having the 18th or 19th best quarterback in the league i think in a previous version of the nfl the bears would have just stuck with justin fields and said we're good here we've got a guy that we think can be really solid I think teams would have been fine with Kirk Cousins in 2005 because they'd say, you know what, we can build around this. This is a guy that works within our offense. Now, I think teams are looking for a top 10 quarterback, and if you're not that, get out of our room. The one team that didn't was the New York Giants, and they are already realizing that they have made a serious mistake with that. So I think that it's a little bit different in terms of my evaluation of the quarterback situation that's taking place right now in the league. How do you feel about yeah, it? Yeah, I... I I don't think it's a problem in terms of the development of the quarterback as it is teams putting the emphasis on a quarterback when they draft them. Like you just go through these last couple of drafts. It feels like teams that are awful everywhere else draft a quarterback and say, good, you fixed our, our problem. Doesn't that always happen though? Teams that are drafting high or bad. Yes, but it also feels like it, in the past, and maybe I'm wrong here, that there wasn't so much of an emphasis on this guy was going to fix the team right away. And then one bad season when you drafted him, it was, well, this team's ass and we have to move on from the quarterback. Like look at what Justin fields was they were ready to move on from him in chicago after the first year we had a terrible team around him and you weren't developing any pieces around him where it was now you finally got some good pieces he started to look well and it's well he's not good we need to move on i feel like the i feel like the labeling of the quarterbacks the moment they get drafted is you are a hall of famer for us zach wilson's another one i think zach wilson's terrible but you brought him in and you said cool you'll fix our jets problem whereas you didn't do anything else to fix that jets problem i, I don't think it's a I don't think it's a development problem. I think it's more of a team looking at it and saying, you need to fix this right away problem. Yeah, I, I think to me, nothing has changed. I, I think it is just more of teams are faster to move on because like you said, it's easier to move on now than it ever has been. And like now you just can't win like without a top 10 quarterback team like Kirk Cousins signing with Atlanta like that. That's a great signing by the Atlanta Falcons because now they have stability. I don't know if you can win with Kirk Cousins. He's not a top 10 quarterback in the NFL. Whoa. I don't know if you're going to be able to win anything, anything meaningful, I should say. You're going to win. Are you going to win anything meaningful? And then you have to ask yourself, was it a success? Was his time in Minnesota a success? I'd argue no. But, you know, you have to do it. So I don't think anything's changed. I just think teams are more willing to move on faster and are willing to, to admit their mistakes. And this is the exact uh, phrasing from Bucky Brooks over on Twitter. Quote, the NFL is a quarterback evaluation and development problem. There's no other way to spin it. The league doesn't know what leads to success at the position. and Coaches don't know how to uh, play around a quarterback's flaws. Until those issues are fixed, we'll continue to see a revolving door at the position. At some point, we can't keep bl blaming the players. This is what high school and colleges are producing. It is time for the league to adapt and to adjust. I just totally disagree with that assessment. I mean, you go back. This is the 2002 NFL draft. 
David Carr went number one overall, broken by the Houston Texans because of his offensive line. Joey Harrington went number three overall in Detroit. He was terrible, never worked in Detroit. Number 32 that year, first round pick, Patrick Ramsey. T-Bone, have you ever heard of that name before? No. Washington Commanders at the time, the Washington Racial Slurs. Like, that's, that's where we're at. 2003. NFL draft, Carson Palmer went number one overall. Byron Leftwich, number seven overall in that year's draft. Like, the Kyle Bowler, number 19. We have always seen busts at the position. Teams are now able to move on more quickly. We remember the great quarterback drafts. The one I didn't mention, 2004. That's where you get Big Ben. You get uh, Eli Manning. You're able to get Phillip Rivers in that year's draft. There are those drafts. Look back to the Patrick Mahomes one. Patrick Mahomes and Josh Allen came out of that one. There have been very recent success stories with teams developing their quarterbacks. Recently, it's been crap. Let's be honest, though, guys. A lot of what we saw in the last couple of drafts, we knew it wasn't very good. That year that uh, Kenny Pickett went in the first round, we all looked at that class, and I think T-Bone, you were the one that said it. None of these guys are first-round picks. Yeah. None of them should be going that, in the first round. That is one thing that I do think has i don't even know if it's changed but it feels more it feels like it's more of a theme now is there are times i look at quarterbacks and i go i don't know if he's a first round quarterback jj mccarthy is one of those examples to me this year to where i look at and i go is he a first round quarterback my answer is no but teams feel so desperate at the position because it is the most important position throughout sports that they reach in the first round and i I don't know if that – I think there's something to that. I, I like the Kenny Pickett draft, like you mentioned. Like, we all knew Kenny Pickett probably wasn't a first-round pick, but the Steelers said we have to do it because we don't have the answer at quarterback. Well, that just – that equals it's going to fail no matter what. Like, it's hard to believe that that story was going to end with a success story with Kenny Pickett and the Pittsburgh Steelers. Yeah, I would just say that that's always happened. Like, Kyle Buller was that guy yeah. for, the, for the Baltimore Ravens back in the day. You know, like Patrick Ramsey. That guy shouldn't have been a first-round pick, but he was. To me, there are three first-round picks Washington. this year at quarterback. There should be. It should be uh, Caleb Williams, Drake May, and Jaden Daniels. Mm -hmm. Outside of that, you probably shouldn't see another quarterback in the first round, but teams are going to reach, sure. and it's probably going to fail. Yeah. And I think that's because they're aiming for that top-10 guy. I think teams are, are trying to reach. Like, I think one of the teams that might draft J.J. McCarthy is the New York Giants. They're not doing that because they're desperate for a quarterback. They have a quarterback that 15 years ago, they probably would have just stuck with. They've got all the money invested in. Hey, let's see what Daniel Jones can be. I think now they know he's not a top 10 guy. He doesn't have a ceiling of a top 10 guy. Let's try to go find the guy that does. I think that's what's changed here. All right, let's continue with some NFL quick hitters. Guys, there was a ranking over on CBSSports.com of the top five AFC teams after the first couple of waves of free agency have been completed. They have the Chiefs at number one, the Ravens at number two, the Texans at three, the Bengals at four, and the Browns at number five. Alex, if you were to rank your top five teams in the AFC as of today, prior to the draft, how would you do it? Chiefs, Texans, Ravens absolutely would be on that ca uh, category. Um, I just don't know what the Browns, because I don't know who their quarterback is, and if it's Deshaun Watson, I don't know if I'd put them in there. I think I would have Miami in that conversation, even with the uncertainty of the, the look of that team. And honestly, I'd put the Raiders at number five. Whoa. I'd put the Raiders. I, I think Who's their quarterback? I think they're going to draft one. And I think they're going to draft one, and I think that's going to be the answer. But I also think defense is going to be the area of expertise for that Raiders team. I, I look at them as the second best team in the AFC West next season over the Chargers and obviously oh, the Broncos. That. And I think they'll be one of those teams. I just, I, I can't buy into the Browns until I know who your quarterback is. Yeah, I, I agree with that. That's why like I might, I have a top four, like, you know, if I had to do a top five, I'd go shrug emoji, like for that fifth spot. Like I, I like what the Chiefs bills? did. Oh yeah, I, I forgot about the bills. the bills. I completely yeah. forgot that, that I didn't say the bills. Okay, they so the bills are above the Josh Raiders. Allen, man. Yeah, yeah, but I, you know. They have made they some significant. They cut a bunch of dudes that didn't play yeah. or weren't good. Let's be honest about what happened with the bills this off season. Yeah. Yeah, yeah I but, forgot them. So I, I should put them over okay. the Raiders. I completely I, forgot that I didn't say that team. I don't know, but like their one addition was Curtis Samuel, and that was yeah. it. And like I, I don't know, I I think there's some left to be desired for the Bills. Sure, Nothing, you know no what? They can the have my five. No, I've not been impressed by what the Jets the have done. President? I think the Bengals have been a top no. three off season. I'd have them ahead of 
either. I I like the Texans. I'd probably have them ahead of what Baltimore did. Baltimore brought in one guy. Yeah, but so. I think that one guy has made a massive yeah, difference for that team. It, I the worry I have with Baltimore is it's a running back, an old running back. Yeah, but look at how bad they were in the red zone last year. And now you've got a dude know, who can get into the end zone for you. If he gets hurt, their whole off season's done. Like, yeah. I. I mean, I to would, be fair, the Chiefs also added one it, guy so far. I mean, I know, if the but Bengals, a wide receiver, but if the Bengals like get one addition. guy hurt, I'd say the I, same thing. I love the I love the Hollywood Brown addition for them, or addition for them. Like, I thought that was a great pickup, and it's a one year deal. Like, Agreed. there's no such thing as a bad one year deal. The the problem I have with the Derrick Henry one, and I do love Derrick Henry being with Baltimore. It's a running back. I, I they running backs guys. There's a reason nobody pays them because they get hurt. Derrick Henry's old. He's losing explosiveness. Like. I love what they did. I would have them in my top four. I would have the Bengals ahead of them, though. I would have, it would be Kansas City one. I would go Houston two, and I would go Bengals three, and then I'd have Baltimore four, and then a giant shrug emoji at five. Yeah. We have the same top four. I would go Buffalo at five. I, I Kansas City is a definitive one. I would Houston, Cincinnati, and Baltimore at two, three, four. I think they're in the second tier, and then I've got Buffalo in a tier of their own at number five. If you've got that quarterback, I've got to put you ahead of some of these other also rants. I can't put the Browns in the same category as the Bills. Yeah, the Browns are doing what they did the last Dolphins year. in the same category as the Bills, the Jets, the Jags. Like, throw them all in the also receiving votes category. Really can't put but the Jags in that conversation. Team that I think we should probably be discussing a little bit more is the Indianapolis Colts. But people aren't ready for that conversation because they don't want to talk about the quarterback who was hurt all of last year. All right, coming up next, 314-399-9646 is the Air Comfort Service text line. Questions and answers coming up next. Hey, it's BK. I got to tell you about my friends over at Victory Men's Health. Whether you're looking for help with erectile dysfunction, testosterone, weight loss, you want some of their other services that they've got, vitamin infusions, their supplement shop, maybe you want to check out their red light therapy, it's all available to you over at Victory Men's Health. If you've heard of some of these other testosterone spots, you walk through the door, it's looking like a hospital, honestly. It's it's all white paint. It's dimly lit. That's not what you're getting over at Victory Men's Health. They're here to unlock your inner champion today. Go check them out. VictoryMensHealth.com is the place where you can go to learn more about them. Or, honestly, just go check out their four great locations across the St. Louis area. They've got one in O'Fallon, Missouri, O'Fallon, Illinois, and then two others. Town and Country, Missouri, and the newest location is available to you right now. Just opened up last month in Sunset Hills, Missouri. You you can read all about them and all of the great different services that they have to offer at Victory Men's Health. It's Victory Men's Health and VictoryMensHealth.com.
314-399-9646 is the Air Comfort Service tax line. A quick edition of questions and answers here on BK and Ferrario. Alex, somebody said, B uh, Alex, what's up with the Avalanche jacket today? You going with the Avs colors? Oh, no, no, I'm not. This is my nice suit. And this is my... Uh... You know, with the blue and the maroon, though. I didn't even realize that. <laughs> and now I'm going to have to hear curbs <laughs> give me crap all day. Damn it. I didn't even think of that. I thought you were ready for Vegas. Vegas. No, they're Vegas. out of the Vegas conversation. Oh. Man, now, do I do I go home and change? No. Yeah. You have to, right? Yeah, for sure. Damn. Man, even if I would have put a white shirt on under it, it would have looked, although it still would have looked like Colorado. Damn. I would keep the I would keep the jacket. Well, the good news is I have. I don't a, know what color though you could go with underneath. Well, the, that's not. The good news is I have a black overcoat that I'll wear tonight, so I'll just keep that on at all times. Well, so you just see the maroon good, shirt. Man. What's that? Well, it's in the 60s. Yeah, have to wear a coat well, just to well, be outside, man. It's like 40s no. outside right now, and no, yeah, you don't need a coat. No, you do. But yeah, thanks for that texture. Didn't need that because now I'm going to be insecure about it all day. All right, three one four three nine 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 six four six is the Air Comfort Service text line for questions and answers, guys. If you had to trade your quarterback today for Caleb Williams. How many guys would you not trade for Caleb Williams, including the contract? Uh, Mahomes, Mahomes, Jackson, Burrow, Burrow Allen. Am I crazy if I would trade Jackson for him? I mean, I, I would, would keep I Lamar. would trade him, but really? I think a lot yeah. of people Even would say. the contract? Yeah, I'd keep Lamar. Okay. Burrow, Allen, C.J. Stroud. Is that it? I think those are my four. Mahomes. I think I would trade everybody else. Burrow, Allen, Stroud. I think yeah, those are the yeah. four guys that I would I, not trade straight up. I would for. trade everybody See, else. It's funny. I, I would hear an argument on Allen, but I would have him on this list right now of not tradable. But the fact that I can always go like, hey, Allen cost the Bills games makes me go, hmm, I wonder if Caleb Williams won't turn the ball over as much. Well, if we do that, then Lamar Jackson should be in that conversation also. That's the, like, I, I think I have to trade Lamar. Yeah. If you're going to do that with. It's $40 million that I'm getting to play with to build the team around yeah caleb williams and i think the caleb williams ceiling is it's different it's a different style of player than lamar but he has the ability to be in a similar stratosphere of what lamar jackson as a as a player if that makes sense like if you're doing the madden overall ratings their overall rating i think could be similar even though they get there in a very very different way all right three one four three nine 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 six four six is the air comfort service text line alex as of today who do you think is the favorite to win the stanley cup I would say it's in the Eastern Conference, and it was either Florida or Carolina. Mm. I don't think anybody in the Western Conference stacks up against those two teams. I like your Florida pick. That would be mine. I, I don't know if you guys have seen it, but Carolina, like Jake Gensel and Evgeny Kuznetsov have Dude, been Evgeny their Evgeny Kuznetsov is like the best player in the league That's suddenly. That's part of the reason why I was like, man, do you take a chance on this? And since the Verona thing didn't work out, so I think a lot of the reason it's working with Kuznetsov is one, he's got the great co the coach in Brindamore, and two, he's surrounded by a lot of Russian players, and as a Russian player, I, I think that matters when you're talking about playing with Dmitry Orlov, who he was with in Washington, Svechnikov. Um, so, but those two guys have been the best players for that team since they were acquired so and the biggest thing that Carolina was missing the last couple of years what was hindering them from being a Stanley Cup final team was offense so I don't think any team in the Western Conference stacks up against those two teams but they've got question marks in goaltending and that's going to be the biggest question mark moving forward who would you go with so I like the Carolina pick I really like what they did at the NHL trade deadline um, the other one that I would go with man I I think it's Carolina. I, I think Carolina won the deadline. I don't know if I would pivot away from them. I, I love what they did. I, and we said it at the time. We were doing the show yep. live from Centene when they made that trade for uh, Kuznetsov. And I was like, whoa, I didn't, if he was available, if I were a contending team, that's an incredible deal. I also wouldn't count out Vegas. Like, if you want me, I, Vegas is the team that we're tracking up. Man, they when they in. get every health, they get in. Holy crap. Yeah, but the thing is, I don't know if they are going to be healthy. Like, it sounds like Mark Stone's thing is serious enough. And I, their goaltending has not been good this like last stretch i just like if you look at if the playoffs were to start today i i think you could flip a coin and who wins between colorado and dallas i think you could flip a coin between who wins edmonton and la and i, I think one of the wild card teams or even both of the wild card teams could really upset the top teams in the west if i look at the eastern conference definitively i think florida beats toronto carolina beats philly the Rangers win against the wild card team and the Bruins win against the wild card team. We also just know the NHL is weird and, and weird stuff happens in the playoffs. Yeah. Goalies stand on their head and it changes the entire outcome of the Nobody series. Nobody saw Boston losing in the first round last year. Nobody. I did. I called it on our show, actually. Coming up next, Jeremy Rutherford, Blues Insider for The Athletic here on 101 ESPN.
Alex Ferrario with you to talk about my friends over at Ted Drew's, the famous frozen custard off of Chippewa that has been open for its 95th season. The St. Louis tradition since 1929, four generations of families have been serving St. Louis since that famous frozen custard. And you know the legendary quality of it, the high quality frozen custard that's made with the finest ingredients. Its batch is crafted with care, attention, and it ensures that creamy texture and rich flavor. Flavor. And when you get out to Tedrus, you could go through whatever flavor you want. I personally love the Oreo concrete. I know I'm simple, but if you're like my wife, you love the s'more, which is the delicious blend of chocolate, marshmallow, and graham crackers, all with that delicious frozen custard. While you're out there, walk across the parking lot, check out the Tedrus gift shop, which is open and has everything you can ask for. It's got Tedrus t-shirts, it's got Tedrus hats, drinkware, and of course, you got the gift cards, which make the perfect gift for whoever you're buying a gift for. So get on out there today, start those family traditions off of Chippewa, and find out why Ted Drews really is good guys and gals. The St. Louis Blues have won four straight games. They're making it interesting in the Western Conference as we get close to the end of the season. And we have Jeremy Rutherford, the Blues insider for The Athletic, on the line to discuss their game tonight against the Colorado Avalanche. Share, appreciate the time as always, man. You were out at Morning Skate. You saw they did make some changes to the power play units. They are the same as they were at the end of the last game. Looks like Kyrou is going to be on that second uh, unit to start this thing out. What did you make of their changes in that regard, or I guess sticking with what they had at the end of the last game? Yeah, I think you got to do it. You know, you're, you're clawing for points, and uh, you saw the success that uh, those changes made in the last game against Anaheim. And for those people catching up on those changes, the Blues went 0 for 3 in the first period on the power play with just five shots on goal. And then in the third play, period they came out with Justin Falk and Braden Shen on that top unit pushing down Tori Krug and Jordan Cairo and they scored three power play goals in that period so Drew Bannister said uh, they want us the game and they're going to stick with them and just as a side note 
Zachary Bolduke getting some reps with the second unit today. Hmm. Uh, he was rotating in and out with uh, Scott Perinovich. And I looked it up, Zachary Bolduke, in the 13 games he's been with the Blues, 250 total, 2 minutes, 50 seconds on the power play. No shots on goal. Drew Bannister was asked, what do you want to see from him if he gets in on that power play? And he said, let go of that shot. we got enough people trying to make passes let's get some uh, pucks on net from Zachary Bolduc yeah you want to see that one timer and JR speaking of moving the, those pieces around on that number one unit d- did you feel like that was a message from Bannister to a Jordan Cairo because the Falcon Krug thing makes sense you're swapping out two quarterbacks but it, it felt like Jordan Cairo was hey you need to shoot the puck more and so we're moving you off for a guy who does shoot in Braden Shen yeah shooting the puck more and you know I just think better management with the puck and it's not just him there's been a lot of people on that on that power play the, this year but you know, a lot of times uh, pucks in Kyrou's hands and either needs to get shot or, or handled better, and it hasn't worked out. And so uh, they needed to make some changes after that first period, and uh, those are the two guys. So I think the way they've got it looking now looks, looks like it makes a lot of sense. We're talking to Jeremy Rutherford here on 101 ESP, and you can find his great work over at The Athletic, and he's on Twitter at JP Rutherford. Uh, JR, I, I did, we were talking earlier today about what it would take for skeptics to start believing that this team can make the playoffs, not necessarily that they'd be a a cup contender or anything, but that they will make the playoffs. And I said, strangely, this game and the game against Ottawa are actually like the least important of the upcoming games because they do have the Minnesota and Vegas one coming up. What is the importance of the game tonight in your mind? How, How would you signify that? I think it's important. And look, when they came back from Boston and granted they, they won in Boston, but you came back home, 17 games left. And I think a lot of people, BK, were saying if they could go 11 and six, they'd put themselves in the conversation. You know, one of those six losses, I think you probably chalked up to a Colorado team that comes in tonight having won six in a row. They've outscored those six opponents 27 to 10. They're really rolling. So this could be one of your six losses down the stretch tonight. But to me, it's how hard do you play against these guys? The Blues had really been building something I had felt uh, going into this Anaheim game, and they didn't play well in the Anaheim game. So do you look at it like it was back-to-backs, less than 24 hours, uh, and, and a team that had been rested? And, and, and I think that you look at that first period, and they just didn't play well. So to me, you could lose 6-4 to four tonight if you play hard. You take the L. But you got to keep moving in the right direction. The Blues haven't done enough of that this year. They did not do it, I don't feel, in that first half of the Anaheim game. So uh, they got something to prove tonight, I think, tonight. And then, uh, obviously, that uh, Vegas game is going to be huge next week. Is there a specific area tonight, JR, that you're going to be focusing in on to see what the Blues look like against a top-tier opponent? Yeah, how they come out. And then, also, you need to see the tight checking. I think we've seen that, for the most part, in the, in the past little stretch, the four-game winning streak, not so much the last game like I mentioned, uh, but, but I think that's the key. Like the, the play is going to start to ramp up here if it hasn't already around the league the last 15 or 20 games, and, and I think the Blues need to play that style like where it looks like every shift matters. And you know, I think for a team that's four points out and uh, these teams, Vegas and, and L.A., are in reach if you can put together something here, I, I just think that it needs to be tighter checking and, and uh, you know good puck support, good puck management. And uh, that's what I would be looking to see tonight, especially against a team that's so fast and so explosive offensively. Uh, they're going to have to play that way to have a chance against these guys. JR, what was the update on Zach Dean? I, I, I'm not trying to suggest that he should be in the lineup tonight. They've won four straight. I don't blame them for not changing up the lineup, but I know you were able to talk to Drew Bannister earlier today. What do you say about Zach Dean potentially getting in the lineup? Yeah, and I know a lot of people, when uh, they put Zach Dean uh, on the plane with them coming home from Boston, thought that, hey, maybe he'll be in the lineup the next game, or or if not that one, uh, the the, the second one. And I think it's just a situation where initially they wanted to get him into a couple practices before they played him, and then the team reeled off uh, four wins now here. So Drew Bannister was asked about, uh, is it because you're winning, you want to keep the same lineup, so therefore Zach's not coming in? And, And he said, yeah, a little bit, but... You know, they had the day off yesterday. He feels like everybody should be rested. And uh, he also feels like the guys that are in the lineup deserve to stay in the lineup. So, you know, at some point we'll see Zach Dean. But, uh, you know, obviously a big game tonight. The Blues want to keep their mojo going. And so he'll be uh, in the press box again tonight. Uh, I, I don't mean to put you on the spot here, Jer, but And I know you, you hear this question all of the time throughout Drew Bannister taking over. But now that they're starting to make this push, you're starting to see that buy-in for a little bit of a stretch. Has your opinion changed on Drew Bannister as the long-term answer as head coach for the Blues? Yeah, I think it ties into 
which direction does Doug Armstrong team? And, you know, let me say that he has continued to say that they want to be a competitive NHL team and, and be in that wild card you know, third place mix for the next year or two while they retool and why they, while they wait to bring in these young players. Um, and if Doug Armstrong feels towards the end of the season or early on in the off season, that Drew Bannister can command the respect of these veterans and, and get them to respond. And I think a lot of that's going to be based, Alex, on the, what we see these last 14 games. Do they show up? You know, then I think he's got a chance to, to hang on to the job. I'll stand by what I've been saying for a while now is if you're going into a more of a retool, a longer retool, or potentially a, a, a rebuild, you know, I don't know that you're going to get a veteran guy to come in here uh, and try to win with this team right now. So, you know, Drew Bannister might be the best bet for this organization. It's just dependent to me on uh, where Doug Armstrong sees things going the next couple of years. He's Jeremy Rutherford. You'll be able to read all of his great work over at The Athletic as he continues to chronicle this Blues season. It has certainly been eventful, if nothing else. You can follow him on Twitter as well, at J.P. Rutherford, for all of his updates tonight from the Blues versus the Avs game. JR, appreciate the time as always, man. Enjoy the game tonight. We'll talk with you again next week. Thanks, boys. Talk to you later. So you got yeah. it. That's Jeremy Rutherford joining us as he does each and every Tuesday here on BK and Ferrario. Appreciate him joining us here on the show. Alex, what do you make of the power play units? I like it. I, I think what you did was you just switched out the power play quarterback. And I, I think the difference between Krug and Falk is Krug's always looking for that pass and Falk's taking the shots. And you don't have one-timers on that power play unit. What you need to do is take advantage of the net front presence, which is why you use Falk on there. Um, and and I, look, you could go Shen or Kairou in this spot. I think what JR said is why I would tinfoil as to why they took Kairou off of it. It just feels like he's that extra pass guy. And sometimes it works. Sometimes it just looks awesome with those backdoor plays. But other times you're making that extra pass and the team expects it and it's coming out of the zone. You need more directness on that number one power play unit. And when you've got a guy who's willing to stand in front of the net like Bray, uh, Jake Neighbors does, I want Thomas, Booch, Shen, and Falk with him. So they're all putting shots on goal no matter where they're at. So you're making teams have to defend that hard. And if you're going to use Bolduc on that number two unit, now you have one one-timer threat with Tory Krug, which I think is a very good thing. And then if you can get Kyra to take those one-timers on the other side, now you're talking about dual threats on that second power play unit. Are we done with the uh, Perunovich long-term plan here in St. Louis, by the way? I think I, I think I am. I don't think the Blues are. Okay. I, mean, I, I think you've if seen... He's not going to be a big part of your power play unit at this point in the season. But he can't be because you've got... Krug and Falk and using two defensemen on those power play units just doesn't work. So unless you move on from one of those guys in the offseason, then you'll need them. But if you're not yeah. going to use them, then I think you're better off having... Do you feel like Falk's been great on the power play? No. But I, I also... That's he, why I ask. Is because like if he can't get in, he hasn't been good on that second power play unit. But that second power play unit hasn't had a net front presence. Although I know they use Sunny there, but it's different than with Jake Neighbors. Like Neighbors seems to have the timing down right, and Sunny maybe not as much. I, I'd like to see a sustained run of Falk on this because Falk was the number one power play quarterback in Carolina for the longest time. Yeah. So put him up there, see if it works. But. It's just so hard to use two defensemen on a power play because unless one of them is a one-time threat. But teams know what you're going to do. you got two guys that are going to pass, and you just read that play. He's Alex Ferrario. He'll be on the Blues pregame tonight starting at 6 o'clock. That'll be right here on your home, the Blues 101 ESPN. Blues versus the Avs, a big game from Enterprise Center. Man, it's just good to have games that matter at yeah, this point in the season. Because I remember this point last year, last dude, year was it was sucked. playing out the string. We're like, hey, it's happening. Hey, look, Sammy Blay. Well, you were, and, hey, and, and we were talking about a top five pick. And you had those guys come in and play well. And so it's like, oh, my gosh, you're not a playoff team, but you're winning hockey games. So now you're going to be 10, 11, 12. Like, at least now we're talking about this team falling out of the top 10 pick, but we're talking a playoff push. And, and the other thing is, like, now the, the difference in the pick is, like, the 17th pick versus the 13th right. pick. Who cares? At yeah. that point, I, I don't. At that point, you just have to. There's not enough of a difference. Yeah, you just have to hope your scouting staff can find Bull Dukes and Snuggeroods and Thomases. Exactly. M meanwhile. The difference between like 12 and 5 is that's massive. real. That is huge. And the difference between 12 and 5 in terms of the percentage chance last year of getting a generational talent 
to move up to number one if you win the lottery, also huge. It goes from like a 1% chance, like a 12% chance, depending on where you fall in terms of the lottery odds. So last year was a lot different than what it is this year. This time around, like, hey, man, just play for the playoffs. It's worth Ron, it. Verona Costas Bedard. Verona Blay. Blaying is just 13 goal outbursts. It's like, wait a minute. Whoa, whoa. Yeah, why can't you play like this year, <laughs> last year, you know? No, they Same don't give with Verona. Them, they don't give them the right chance like Dylan Carlson. That's Tanner Hendrickson. He's Alex Ferrario. I'm Brandon sure. Kylie. Coming up next, 314-399-9646 is the Air Cup for Service. Text line for better to forget it here on 101 ESPN.
Oh, that one hurt. Also, I feel it like breakfast, like I feel like breakfast almost came up on How's that one. How are you feeling, bud? Oh, for breakfast? Well, not a quick as, vibe check. Not as good now with like, people pointing out my Colorado Avalanche soup. That made me feel worse, but... I like your room um, for Vegas. Look, my family, my family was sick over the last week. It went from my youngest to my oldest to my wife, and I thought I... I thought I overcame it, but instead the Kraken was laying dormant in my system sure. and now it's about to be released. I don't know if it's going to be this afternoon, tonight, tomorrow morning, but the Kraken will be released at some point. 3143 is the dirty. air comfort service text line for bet it or forget it. Guys, better to forget it. The Cardinals are happy about their Kyle Gibson signing. Out, forget it, whatever what, we're playing. What did he do today? Well, he's gone two innings. He oh, made, has made he? it through only wow. 22 pitches to get through two innings. Yeah. What was that 22nd pitch? He's given up three hits, has a strikeout. All over 105 miles an hour off to the bat. Has not walked anybody. Uh, because they're hitting it. Exit Velo so far today against uh, Kyle Gibson. 89, 103, 107, 97, 104. But it's spring training, guys. Kyle Gibson, who's been in the league for like 13 years, is working on stuff. Yeah. Um. And none of those are the home run that he apparently just <laughs> gave up. That one had to be like 115 miles an hour. So, yeah, forget uh, it. Yeah. Instead, you could have, you know, signed Blake Snell or Jordan Montgomery. I'd forget it. You know? Yeah, forget it. I, I If there was one signing that they're happy with, it would be probably Lynn. Lynn's been solid in spring. Gibson yeah. has a solid 11.6 <laughs> ERA. Yeah. No surprises there. Who could have seen that a guy that has never really been a league average pitcher is going to struggle? Who could have seen it? He's working on stuff, man. No, yeah. he's not. No, you don't work on stuff when you're a savvy vet like they got I'm in gonna Kyle bet Gibson. Because he's healthy and that's all they care about. Yeah, sure. They, okay. I, I'm being totally. All they care is that he's he has thrown 22 pitches. He's gotten through two innings at this pace. He would be on pace to get you through six or seven. Yeah, that's why he, I, I'm, not telling, six turn runs. Be, I'm yeah. not telling you that that's a good thing, guys. I'm telling you what the Cardinals would no, tell you yeah. about the signing. You're the Cardinals. That's what you are. I've told you I have a list in front of me no, right here. I never of the heard guys that. that I wish the Cardinals would have signed. Blake Snell, Dylan Cease, Robbie Ray, no. Chris Sale. One that of those list four. That list says nobody because I love what John Mozeliak pulled off. Alex, what do you have for better to forget? Uh, better to forget it, guys. Doug Armstrong pulls off a deal this offseason to free up seven million dollars. Deal or deals, I'll put it that way. Seven is aggressive because there's only like two guys on the roster that would meet that threshold. Or, but if you want to do six and a half. Or you could combine multiple okay. guys. I'm betting it. I think they're going to trade one of their defensemen. I don't know who it will be. If I had to bet, I would say they do it again with Tory Krug. I, I'm going to be upset if that's the case. I think they should instead try to trade Justin Falk. But I'll bet it. I think they end up trading one of their defensemen in the offseason. I'll bet it as well because I think they'll either trade a defenseman or they'll trade Jordan Cairo. I, uh, I'm i not going to rule out a Cairo deal because I, I brought that one up. Yeah, I – it. Though I think it is clear he's a second-line winger, it is still a pretty disappointing season from Jordan Cairo, in my opinion. Um, I agree. So I would say that they may be open to exploring it because it's their last opportunity to, because then the no trade clause kicks in after, I think it's like July 1st or something like that in the offseason. So I think they'll explore it, and they may look to move on because though he would be a solid second-line winger, A, the season's a little alarming from a goal production standpoint, I would say, and B... I, I think it's a bit of an overpay for a second line winger at this point. So I, I would say I would bet this. Alex, um, do you remember what? Okay, so Berube was fired after the Detroit game. Yeah, December 13th. Since then, Jordan Cairo has 16 goals and 33 points in 40 games under Drew Bannister. So that's essentially half the season. <clears throat> How would we feel if this year, in, like if we eliminated everything that happened with Craig Berube? If I told you, Jordan Cairo finished the year with 32 goals and 66 points. How would you feel about that season instead of what he's currently on pace for? Feel good about it, but not great. Because I think... He's, by the way, a minus three in that yeah. stretch. So he's that's been, been imp pretty that's improved. But to me... And he's averaging almost 19 minutes a game. To me, to take that next level, you need a 40-goal scorer with Robert Thomas. And I, and I don't believe he is that. And if he's not that, that's eight and a half million dollars that you're paying to be your second line winger, which is a great thing. Maybe Snuggerud comes in and becomes a 40 goal scorer for you. And you're like, whoa, where did this come from? Now you're cooking. But if he doesn't, which I can't put that type of pressure on a kid coming in, I'm looking at it saying, well, the only way Robert Thomas becomes a 100 point player is if he has a 40 goal scorer with him. And in that scenario, Kyra's not it.
Yeah. I just found it interesting that yeah. his his production has taken on a pretty swift boost. But a lot of that, Barubi. a lot of that t- was a chunk in the like right when Bannister was here, and for about a month and a half. If you look at his last like 15 games, it has not been that. I way. think it's been better than you think, because he had that that game where he had the three goals. Yeah. Um, in the last, let's see here. I'll just go through this real quick. In the last 21 games, he has eight goals, eight, eight assists, 16 points. Okay, the the production's actually been a little better than I think a lot of people are willing to give a credit for. He's he's been decent. In his last 10 games or so, the goal production isn't there as much. Two goals in his last 14. But as we've talked about before, that's goal scorers, man. They go through these weird slumps where over a 10-game stretch, they get like one goal for you, and then boom, we've seen this with Brandon Saad this year, where he had like a 15-game stretch where he disappeared from the score sheet. He's going to once again finish with like 25 goals this season because that's the way that it operates. But, but does but but does that scream top line player? No. And that's the question because right now I'm not sure you could come into the season saying I know what to expect from him. Three years ago it was 27 goals in 74 games. Last year 37 and 79. This year it's probably going to be somewhere between 25 and 28. And can I? And he's played with Thomas, by the way, over half of the season. Can I bring up the uh, ugly part and say it out loud? Is he a culture guy? Is he a guy that is the chainsaw to the tree? Well, and that's and the, re- the only the reason question. I bring that up is because we've seen the play out there. We kind of heard the subtle swipe, I will call it, when Robert Thomas said when Kairou's on his game, he is a great player. And we know the Baruby stuff that came out. Yeah, I, and I, that's the reason I bring that up. And you've seen a lot of teams. I want our tree to grow, not be cut down. Ew, way to go, David. We've worst. seen a lot of teams get rid of culture guys. Because they knew it wasn't worth. I mean, look, guys, Colorado traded Ryan Johansson, who they traded for in the offseason. And when they traded him, they went on a six-game win streak. Can I tell you a little bit about what Victor Scott has done in the first oh, couple of please. innings of the game? Dropped a ball in center field, struck out twice. Yeah. The opposite. Homer. Stat cast data on a spectacular Homer. driving <laughs> cat, diving catch by Victor Scott. Catch probability 35%, according to this. Um, yes. Sprint speed was about 25 feet per second. Amazing, apparently, catch in center field, and then went up to the plate, and I'm assuming this is a bunt, 13-mile-an-hour single. Well, that <laughs> had to be a bunt. I love it. He, I love it so much. When he just makes amazing. that catch in center field, does Dylan Carlson just throw his glove down and say, son of a... I has to, Carl- right? Damn has to. Carlson's reaction is, damn, I would not have caught that. <laughs> and he looks over at Ollie, and he's like, no. No, 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 no. I'll, t- I'll play yeah. and I'll play. Yeah. I just want to be here. By, you know he ran by Ollie and went, I love left field, Ollie. <laughs> I just find that to be interesting. Now, like, right, Burleson sitting on the bench going, no. <laughs> uh, guys, bet it or forget it. We start to see a new theme across Major League Baseball free agency and teams hold out for better team-friendly deals with top free agents like we saw this offseason. Oh, forget it because teams it. always want to get their offseason done. Yeah, Mo. Yeah. I, I just think that teams like teams, certainty though. and – more often than not, they want to get these guys into camp. Teams don't want to be like the Giants. Like, what the Giants are doing, while we'll give them their praise, it's pretty embarrassing that they had to go into the late portion of spring training to sign Blake Snell and Matt Chapman to give themselves a fighting chance to just be competitive this season. That's embarrassing if you're the Giants. And the only reason it happened is because they missed out on everybody else. Shohei told them no. Yamamoto told them no. They wanted to get other guys, but they didn't have the opportunity to do so because they got outbid for them. So... I'm I'm forgetting this. I don't think that this will be a trend. We see this once every like five years. We saw it with Harper and Machado that off season. It was weird. They signed late into spring training, and then things started to get back to normal. And then we got another cycle, and then it will get back to normal. So I'll say forget it. I'm going to say bet it because I do think that there are going to be teams that don't want to pay the hefty prices that are on free agents. And when nobody signs them, there's going to be a team that says, "Wow, well, we'll just wait this one out so we can swoop in at the last minute. So the reason I bring this up, and I typically have been the guy that is, says forget it, is there's just some guys out there that don't make sense as to why you have to wait on them. Like, why is J.D. Martinez <clears throat> still a free agent? Like, Old. I can't understand his mark. Yeah, oh, well, he's the Cardinals an should incredible sign hitter still. I'm with you. Like, the Snell one makes sense. Like, if you didn't want to give Blake Snell five years, I mean, I get it. You know, Jordan Montgomery, you don't want to give him five years. I get it. Matt Chapman, five years. I get it. But at some point, Blake Snell knew he wasn't getting five years, and then there was teams still not going out there to sign him to a one- or a two-year deal. For, I think he was waiting for injuries. He was hoping that the injury for Garrett Cole was going to be enough for the Yankees to say, you know what, screw it, we'll give you the five-year, $150 million deal you're looking for, and they didn't. So I think that's why he was waiting. On J.D. Martinez, I think that's just a matter of there's not very many DH spots available. And so when you have a player that is exclusively a designated hitter, 
there were other guys that were on top of the priority list for teams. He's, I think it's I, he, I would sign J.D. Martinez. He was really good last year. I, I think it's he's an injury silly. signing. He's going to be a guy that after an injury Absolutely. takes place, they sign him. He'll be the guy that gets signed in the middle of the season and he comes in and you're like, well, where'd this come from? And because, offense is underperforming. They yeah. need a right handed bat. They're like, you know what, J.D. Martinez, come on in. The prospect that they were hoping stepped in and was the D.H. for him exactly. wasn't good and they had to send him back down. See, that's where I would say, like, I just don't understand this team process, and I think this is where baseball's got an issue of, well, let's just see what the prospect has to do. Man, I can already tell you, J.D. Martinez is going to be a lot better than a lot of the prospects a lot of teams are going to run out there this year. I, I can guarantee that I can hit the button right now and tell you Martinez is going to be better than some of the prospects teams are running out. Cubs are running out a couple prospects, like, uh, what's his name? Crow Armstrong. Crow Armstrong, whatever his name is. I will hit oh, a button think. now that J.D. Martinez will be a better hitter this year than him. And I'm not even saying the Cubs should sign him. I'm just using that as an example. The thing is, he's a center fielder, and so there's flexibility. Like, I, I hear what you're saying, but I, this is the case for a lot of guys. Like, it. the Cardinals have Nolan Gorman and Brendan Donovan. You're not going to sign J.D. Martinez to be in that spot. And I think a lot of teams fit into that criteria. Again, I agree with you that a team should sign him. But almost every team in baseball will look at it and say, well, we've got these internal options that we want to see first. It's kind of like what the Cardinals were a few years ago where they had Juan Yepes and can't remember who the lefty bat was, but another lefty bat that was available to them. And they were like, ah, neither of these guys are really hitting the way that we want them to. Let's go get Corey Dickerson and Albert Pujols, and they'll be our designated hitters. Oh. Eventually, somebody's going to get into that spot with Sorry. J.D. Martinez. Did, say, did I say that out loud? All right, let's get to a few of these from the text line. 314-399-9646 is the Air Comfort Service text line for better to forget it. Better to forget it, guys. Yadier Molina not showing up for Cardinals camp is a sign that Wilson Contreras is once again going to be terrible defensively. Oh, forget it. Wasn't terrible defensively last year. People blew it out of proportion. <laughs> One guy did, Jack Flaherty. I'll forget this, but I would disagree on the part he wasn't bad. He was bad defensively. Bad, um, bad is not terrible defensively. Uh, terrible defensively is the dude was a liability I every mean, single game, and I, I don't think he was. I felt better about Herrera behind the plate last year than I did Contreras. So that's telling me something on his five-year contract. Is Herrera one of the best bats in the second half of the season? I mean, he was actually pretty good behind the plate. All right, better to forget it. I I, I don't think that it's because of Yadier Molina. I don't think Yadier was going to fix him. I don't think... Yeah, Wilson Contreras is exactly who Wilson Contreras is. Better to forget it, the Cardinals will trade for Pablo Lopez at the deadline. God, I hope yeah, so. That ain't happening. He's been my... Just Pablo, S- Pablo Sandoval, maybe. Reunite the top. He's in camp, I guess. I know uh, he the is. Way, They'll trade the for him because they need more leadership. Uh, reunite the top two in the uh, Twins rotation yeah. for me. I right mean, though. it worked for him. I'm forgetting. I, they're... He's They're not trading for anybody. Say, I thought he had a contract extension. Uh, better to forget it, guys. We will see quarterbacks go in each of the top four picks in this year's NFL draft. I'm going to bet this because I think a team trades up to draft J.J. McCarthy. I think I saw a mock draft earlier today. I think it was Daniel Jeremiah. He said that this was pure chaos is what he did it, but he had the Vikings trade up to draft the Vikings McCarthy. Are, I don't think I've ever seen a team so clearly in the mix to trade up in the first round for a quarterback this far away from the draft as we are watching right now with the Minnesota Vikings. They are shouting to everybody that will listen with their actions. We are going to trade up. It's a matter of when, not if. It reminds me of when the Rams and the Eagles that offseason uh, prior to the draft where they got Jared Goff and Carson Wentz at the top of the draft didn't really work out for either of them, but they traded up pretty early to be able to go one, two. That's not happening this year. Chicago, Washington, I don't think either are trading out. But I think Denver, I think Vegas, I think the uh, Titans and Giants, all of those teams along with Minnesota are potential trade-up candidates. Minnesota trading up back into the first round. They now have two first-round selections to use. I think that's what's going to end up happening. Minnesota will trade up to number four, and they'll be top four selections quarterbacks. Yeah, I'd bet this as well because I think Alex is spot on. I think somebody's trading up to four with Arizona to maybe get that guy or if New England wants to trade out if New England trades out then no this will not happen I don't Agreed. think but I, I think they take a quarterback and I think you're right there's multiple teams that have just been like Vegas screams a team that's going to tr- try and trade up to get a See, quarterback I think, I think Vegas sits and hopes that Penix Jr. falls to him I think Penix Jr. is the guy that they're like well let's get him that's what it, he had today in his Jeremiah did yeah yeah I think I mom. think you're right but I, I I think the Raiders sit and say whether it's Bo Nix or Penix Jr. one of those guys fall to us and we'll draft him because we don't need him right away unless he impresses out of camp coming up in about 15 minutes or so we're going to dive into the junk drawer with the story 
too crazy to believe in the NBA. We'll get into that coming up here in just a little bit. But next, John Mozeliak made a comment about why he decided to give a contract extension to Ollie Marmol the other day. I wonder who this is applying to. We'll talk about it next year on 101 ESPN. Alex Ferrario with you to talk about my insurance agent, Tracy Bibb. When was the last time you've talked to your insurance agent? And for a lot of people listening that just heard that, they're thinking, I don't know if I ever have spoken to my insurance agent. Well, now is the time to change because of that. Because you need the customer service. You need that friendly service that when something happens, and look, something's going to happen, springtime, more rain, you could be getting flooding damage in the basement of your house. I had that happen to me. You could be getting tree limbs falling down in your backyard. Also had that happened to me or maybe it's just the simple fender bender on the side of the road if you don't have that customer service with an insurance agent that's available for you then what are you paying the money for so that's why you need to call tracy and her team they'll talk with you about the prices that you're paying what falls under the umbrella they'll make sure that it's competitive rates that you're not overpaying for certain things and you know that if something goes wrong they're available for you so give tracy a call today tell her alex ferrario sent you and she'll give you a free non-committal quote she'll walk you through the whole process even cancel your previous insurance agent 314-328-4260 that's 314-328-4260 it's no fib you're always in great hands with the bib
Jared Hendrickson here with a Sports Center update driven by Johnny Londoff Chevrolet and Johnny Londoff Autoplex. The Blues back in action tonight as they take on the Colorado Avalanche. And we'll have pregame coverage starting at 6 o'clock with Alex Ferrario and Joey Vitale. And then Joey will join Chris Kerber for puck drop at 7. Cardinals are back in action today in spring training as they've got a split squad doubleheader. They currently lead the Miami Marlins 4-2 to two in the bottom of the second. Tonight they will take on the New York Mets in which Lance Lynn will get the start. And Major League Baseball will have the season get underway tomorrow morning at 5.05 a.m. as the Dodgers take on the Padres in Korea as will be Tyler Glass now versus you Darvish. The sports from today is driven by Johnny Lana. Find your road shot 24-7 at lanoff.com, lanoffautoplex.com. Are you kidding me? John Mosaloc had an interesting quote the other day. He said, quote, as I sit in meetings right now and we talk through some things, especially how we have to think about the roster building decisions, the one thing I don't want to have happen is for somebody like Ollie Marmol to think about it for a, quote, win now at the expense of the bigger and better decision down the road because there's pressure for him to win right now. If we knew he was going to be the manager anyway, let's just deal with it now. That's how we got to this decision. Again, that was John Mosaloc the other day to reporters down in Jupiter talking about why they decided to extend Ollie Marmol. With Alex Ferrario and Tanner Hendrickson, I'm Brandon Kylie. Alex that quote stood out to me because it made me think, especially as we're watching Victor Scott, who today has a bunt single where he outran the throw by going 30 feet per second, which is considered to be elite. And he had a catch in center field, a diving catch, which had a 35% catch probability. Both plays that I don't know that you had a player on the team last year that would have made them. That's the kind of thing that you think about as a, hmm, this is both a win now, but also a, let's take a peek at the pu a future kind of a decision early in the season. When you hear that quote from John Mosaloc, I don't want Ollie thinking about making decisions for the here and now as opposed to the long-term future. What do you think that applies to? Is there a player? Is there a situation? What do you think he's thinking about? I mean, I think it comes down to two guys, Victor Scott and Mason Wynn. Uh, and those are the two guys that, I mean, would fall into this category because we're not talking about any pitchers that are pushing for it. People aren't clamoring for Tink Hens and TK Roby to be up here. Uh, it comes down to the two guys that are young guys that people want to see a lot of this season, and it's Victor Scott and Mason Wynn. M my questioning with that, though, is like the first part of it. We, we don't want him to feel pressure of winning right now. Shouldn't that be the pressure for you after a 91 loss season last year? Because if you're a team that's not expecting to be in the playoffs, well, then, yeah, sure, you lock up a guy because we don't want him to feel the pressure of winning right now. We want him to focus on the future. That sounds like a team that's in the middle of a rebuild and is trying to get on the other side of it. I, I mean, maybe I'm wrong here, but it feels like there should be pressure to win right now. I would say what he's probably referencing there, and this is me reading between the lines, is like Brandon Crawford versus Mason Wynn. Brandon Crawford might actually be the better player quote unquote right now for you in terms of what he's going to produce for you at the plate it's possible don't go with him just because mason went struggling that kind of a decision but right? you don't need but again like why are we worrying about the 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 offense that brandon crawford can provide what to you're you just saying if you're having other guys that are struggling early in the season but if brandon crawford's the reason that you're not competing right now because his bat plays better than mason wins i'd say you're underperforming in other areas i'm agreeing with you but what i'm saying is if you're in mo's shoes the reason why you would want that to be out there of hey you don't have to make the decision to win now as opposed to win for the future like you don't want you don't want ollie thinking to himself my best chance to win today is by putting brandon crawford in the lineup and if he if he thinks about it like that you're why do we have mason win here see what i'm saying like that mason win is a, a player for the future and for the right now but it's entirely possible that the better hitter on the roster right now is Brandon Crawford. I don't think that should surprise anybody, right? No, it doesn't surprise me. But uh, again, I'm just not worried about that. But I, I'm not either. But you're saying why would they have this? 
wh why would this not be the way that they go? Well, because that's potentially one of the moves that you make if you're exclusively talking about winning today. Yeah, maybe I'm just not understanding it because like, I, I feel like it's a weird message to have. Like, we want to lock him up because we don't want him to worry about winning right now. We want him to worry about winning in the future. Well, See, it, I, it's I, both, right? Like, you're, you're going to have to make a decision every single day. I think what this does, to your point on win, is like if you're Ali Marmol and you don't have the contract and you're worried of a slow start in April means I'm going to be fired, it's possible they could start the year three and seven. He may then go, man, when's not hitting, we got to pull him. That, now now he may be saying, okay, I can at least go the first month of the season. We'll see. The record doesn't matter. The record does matter, actually. I mean, the record matters. But what I'm saying is, it's not going to dictate, man, we're three and seven. We have to pull pull out on Mason Wynn right now. We have to go to Brandon Crawford, and we've got to send Mason Wynn down to work on his bat. There's more leeway. There's like a month leeway for a Mason Wynn, for a uh, Victor Scott in center field. If it's they Alec have that Burleson and a DH. Like, it's all these different things, right? You've got young guys that you want to get at bats for, and if they get off to a slow start offensively, you don't want to just immediately turn it over to the veterans. I think they did this a couple of years ago. Now, it worked out. But with Albert Pujols and Corey Dickerson getting the opportunities at DH over some of their younger players, they were winning now at the expense of potentially longer-term development with a guy like Juan Yepes, for example. That That's what I'm talking about, Alex, is like, when you make the decision on your lineup, if Mason Wynn is in the stint or in the stretch of a one for 36, which is very possible. We all need to acknowledge, like in the first 10 games, if he goes one for 36, he should still be in the lineup in the 11th game because of what he does for you. But are there people really going to be clamoring for Brandon Crawford if Mason Wynn's going one for 36? Maybe not, but if the manager for? is in yeah. place and he is on the hot seat going into the season and you do not have a contract in place, you may make the choice of, hey, my best chance to get a win today is the guy that might go one for three as opposed to the guy that's gone one for 36 in the last nine games for me with Mason Wynn. I, am, I, am I not explaining no, this No, well? you're explaining. I just, like I said, it's just confusing to me. I, I think that's how he would have potentially approached it, though, if you're Ollie Marble. Like, I it think, would have been understandable. Yeah, like, human if, nature if you would feel say, like hey, this guy, fired. I've seen this guy win championships as a starting shortstop. Yeah. I don't think he's still that guy anymore, but... The reason why you want to make sure that this is in place, and I think they should have just gotten all of this out of the way previously. Like, I'm, I'm almost talking out of both sides of my mouth, but I'm trying to explain the Cardinals' perspective on this if this is what they were thinking of. You want him making decisions both for the here and now, obviously. M nobody wants to win more than Ollie. I promise you. His job is literally on the line for it. But you well, want not to make anymore. I still think it is. You want to making decisions for the here and now, but also for the long term. You want to balance those two things out. And I think if he was a lame duck manager, so to speak, you could have had that maybe get out of balance, out of whack a little bit. I do want to talk about the we've spent a lot of time on the Mason Wynn side of things here. The Victor Scott thing, I think, is really interesting in this. Do you think he was part of the conversation with this? Like, Do you think he, in the back of his head as he's talking about decisions for now, but also the future? I think Wynn was definitely a part of that. Was he also referencing in that spot? Victor Scott in your mind. I, I personally think so because you don't want to stunt the development of him if you want him on this team to win right now. If that's what the concern was, well, then Ollie, for how Victor Scott has played, would be like, well, we need that guy to start the season with us because we don't have a center fielder. And if you're going down this path of, you know, we want you to focus on the future, even if Victor Scott dominates in spring training, if you feel like it's better for his development to start in Memphis, then figure it out for a couple of months. And if it doesn't look great with Carlson and Donovan or Carlson and Burleson in the outfield, you'll be fine. Don't worry about it. Yeah, I... I think it does play into it a little bit because it is no, there is no like, man, if Victor Scott's not hitting, you have to go to like Dylan Carlson. You have to try Carlson. You have to try Burleson and left. I, I think this actually applies to Carlson potentially too, because I think Carlson right now is their starting left fielder. I think the outfield currently constructed is going to be Carlson and left, Scott and center, and Walker and right. And I think what this allows, this comment from Mo is. Hey, let's give Scott runway. You know, let's not just go like a week and it's a struggle and, man, your job's on the line. You all of a sudden have to throw Burleson into left field and make our defense worse. I, I think it applies to – I think it does apply to Victor Scott. I think it applies a little bit to Carlson out in left field to try and give them the best defensive alignment in the outfield. I think this also applies to like a Nolan Gorman, for example. Gorman last year – I don't remember what month it was. I think it may have been May or June. 
was awful at the plate, genuinely awful, like a 143 batting average. Yeah. But because Ollie knew his job was safe at the time because Mo had came out and said it publicly, he could continue to run him out here. I think the same case will be true this year as well. If Gorman goes through a early struggle in April, instead of going, man, I've got to go to like Matt Carpenter or Alec Burleson as DH, he can continue to run out Gorman's bat in that DH spot because of the pressure now coming off of their, there is pressure to win. But it is no longer like, hey, if I have a first month, my job is done. You can still potentially recover from a bad first month if you're Ali Marmol. I'm going to be interested to see how this all plays out. Really interested with some of the young guys because they have so many different timelines taking place simultaneously right now. Like they've got these young guys that they're trying to bet on for the future with Walker and Wynn and Scott and JC and Gorman and Donovan and Burleson and Herrera, like I have basically named an entire lineup of players that you could have that are long-term fixtures for the Cardinals organization, they believe. But also you've got Matt Carpenter and Paul Goldschmidt and Nolan Arnato and Wilson Contreras and the entire pitching staff. Just look over here. Like it, there is like no middle ground to this roster. The, the only guys that are like that 27 to 30-ish range are like Carlson, I guess kind of close to that and then like Tommy Edmond who's yeah. not even going to be a part of the opening day roster and then some of the guys in the bullpen like your, your actual core group of players is all on one end of the spectrum or the other so it's going to be really interested to see how they try to thread this needle it's a it's a weird roster but it has the potential to be fun to watch all right the junk drawer is coming up next here on 101 ESPN
Alex, have you ever slept on a um, an air mattress before? Oh yeah, they're awful. Team one of you. Them. Yeah, I'm not a fan. Todd, there's nothing more annoying than trying to sleep on an air mattress, and when you roll, it goes. <laughs> Wakes you up. Terrible air mattress impersonation, by the way. That was that was really something, buddy. Yeah, it was like a creaking door. So when we had Luca, we slept out in the living room for a while. And it's because he, he was in the bassinet, wanted to make it easier for both of us to be able to help with the nighttime feeds. We just go out to the living room, right? And Kara asked me at the time, she's like, Do you want should we do the couch? Should we do an air mattress? What do you think would be easier? I was like, we have a nice couch. We spent money on this couch. I am not sleeping on an air mattress. We are above that. We are over the age of 30, right? When I say above that, I'm not talking down to anybody that sleeps on an air mattress. Do you? But if I don't have to sleep hey, on an air mattress, look, I'm not going to yeah, sleep on an air mattress. My back can't handle an air mattress anymore, and I'm 33. The reason why I'm bringing this up, Alex, is because DeAndre Ayton was asked recently why he struggled to start out this season. His response, quote, my body just wasn't my body. People forget the human element of this. I'm just adjusting to everybody. Being comfortable waking up. I didn't have a bed for quite some time. I was on an air mattress trying to figure this out. Wasn't he quotes. a first overall pick? And he's got a huge contract Did, at this point. I, I this mean, is the same guy that couldn't get to the basketball game because his neighborhood had the ice remember oh, this, earlier this, this year dude I forgot seems like that, that was eight this dude seems like an excuse factory so the hell are you sleeping on an air mattress when you were drafted that high he's making like 35 million dollars a year deandre ayton is i mean Yo, good, man good on him if he's money management but like buy yourself a damn bed <laughs> like why are you sleeping on a freaking air mattress lebron james spends a million dollars a year on his body a million dollars per per year that'd on his nice. body that'd be nice Meanwhile, DeAndre Ayton's out here sleeping on an air mattress. How much do you think you spend a year on your body? Uh, not a million. I probably am more in the negative from I eating out. I was say, I don't think I actually spend, but how much fast food I eat, it probably is Can you dead. imagine what the response would be here locally? I'm trying to think if Jordan Kyrou came out after the season. Because oh, DeAndre Ayton's kind of their equivalent of yeah. that, right? He's just oh, this... Yeah. It's a controversial figure that everybody's like, man, look at all of the talent. If he could just extract it and cared a little bit, he would be so good. That's kind of what we're feeling like here in St. Louis with, with Kyrou. If Kyrou came out and there was a great long-form piece with JR after the season about what went wrong, why did he take a step back in his development this year? And he was like, you know what, JR? I got to tell you, I moved into a new house this year. And I slept on an air mattress. And I couldn't figure out what kind of bed I wanted, so I just slept on an air mattress for the first three right, months. No, that, that, that would be completely obliterated. That would be completely ob If you're the Phoenix Suns after you draft that guy. He's and not you, even with Phoenix anymore. No, yeah, I know. He's, he's with Portland. Portland but like when he was drafted in Phoenix, which I'm assuming this is part of the problem, right? It started right. this way. If you're drafted by Phoenix, and look, if this is a problem, you know he's telling his teammates, like, ah, oh, damn, my back hurts. I've been sleeping on an air mattress. How the hell, if you're the Phoenix Suns, you don't find some type of endorsement with a mattress company to say let's buy you a Tempur-Pedic DeAndre it's ridiculous it's not ideal like how you know I never made excuses when I first started doing this show because I, I never a, had a couch slept on a damn futon for like the first four years of high school because I was like ah, futon sounds fun you wake up uh, uh, yeah 18 just, years old <laughs> there should be a clause in his contract that says don't DeAndre, talk you you slept on a air mattress for the first two months of the season you no longer have any guaranteed money on your contract. yeah you're out <laughs> you're out of this you. there's if an you opt get out hurt, if your back is hurting in a game you lose all payments for that game because you did this yeah this is on you my friend there's a mattress opt out that if you're not willing to yeah. spend money on a good mattress that we we opt out of your contract coming up next we'll continue our countdown of the 20 most important cardinals for the 2024 season with the guy that i think is way too low on our list we'll discuss it next year on 101 espn With Alex Ferrario, I'm Brandon Kiley for our friends over at Circus Sports in Illinois. Alex, Circus Sportsbook is the largest sports book in Las Vegas, and it is now available to each and every one of you in the state of Illinois. It's available to you at your fingertips. Just download the app today. It's the Circus Sports Illinois app. We are already 
in the month of March, and you know what that means. College basketball day and night. It begins tonight with the first four. If you want to put your bets in on Wagner versus Howard or Colorado versus Virginia, you can do that tonight on the Circa Sports app. Alex, I know you're going to be getting in on this. All of those money line par- parlays coming your way. Yeah, can I do a parlay for the play-in games? That can I? I'm absolutely doing a parlay on the play-in games because you know I am. Because Circa Sports, they're not limiting people based off of their winnings. And look, what I love about Circus Sports is they're so confident in their tight money line splits, their high li- app limits. They are transparent about you going out, checking out other sports betting apps because they know you'll come back after you compare those lines. So find out why BK and I only use the Circus Sports book app in Illinois. If you or someone you know may have a problem with gambling, call 1 800 Gambler or text I L G A M B to 833 234. Twenty most important Cardinals for the 2024 season. Number nine, Nolan Gorman. That ball launched high in the air, right center field. That baby's belted. That baby is long gone. Swing and a drive. That one's not coming back. Way out of here. Back row of the bleachers. High fly ball. Tomahawk deep right. How far is that going? All the way to the back of the bleachers. Wow, a tape measure homer for Nolan Gorman. At number nine on our countdown of the 20 most important Cardinals for the 2024 season, it is Nolan Gorman, the young left-handed power hitter for the St. Louis Cardinals last year. Had a breakout season, I think it's fair to say. 27 home runs in 119 games for the Cardinals at just 23 years old. One of the better pure power left-handed hitters in the game. Alex, I think this is way too low. I think you ruined this list for us right here with Nolan Gorman. What'd you do? I had Nolan Gorman at number five. Jesus. On my list of the 20 most important That's Cardinals little, heading into 2024. That's a little aggressive. Tebow had him at number seven. Alex had him at number 14. So I'm genuinely curious, Alex. When I think about this list and the way that I write it out, I think about for the Cardinals to reach their ceiling this season, who are the most important players? And I'll explain why I had Nolan Gorman so high here in just a minute. But why did you have him so low? Why was he lower on your list than he was for us? Like you had Ryan Helsley, Mason Wynn, and Lance Lynn ahead of, or excuse me, 
You didn't. Yeah, Lance Lynn ahead of him on yeah. your list. Lance, Lance. I, I had Lance Lynn because, I mean, I, I think pitching is the utmost importance for this team right now. And Helsley I had up there because, as we talked about when we did, I, I felt like you don't have another closer that can fill that void for them. Lance Lynn, that's the guy that's supposed to be providing you innings and might be your third or fourth best pitcher this season. The reason I had Gorman so low on this list is, look, I think he's going to be a massive piece for this team. And I think his bat is going to be the reason why. But I, I look at it and say, OK, well, if he doesn't hit, I don't think that plagues the team as much, because as we've talked about, I I can put five different bats on the offensive side that are more important than the than Nolan Gorman going into this season. And at the position, if he doesn't look great there, you put Brendan Donovan at second base and Nolan Gorman becomes your DH. So. I put him low because we're relying on his offense to be a massive piece for this team. And again, if Nolan Gorman's not hitting well, I'm not going to point at that and say, well, that's why this team was awful. I'm going to point at Goldschmidt, Arenado, Walker, Contreras, and saying that's why this team is struggling. I think I'm seeing where the difference is. You're looking at it as the floor. I'm looking at it as the ceiling. It's one of those classic arguments, right? What are we talking about? Are we talking about how do you get to the playoffs or are we talking about how you win the World Series? For me... If well, you don't, we know that's not happening. But I'm talking about reaching their ceiling, and their ceiling should be winning the World Series this year, right? That's what everybody's hoping for, at least. For me, this team cannot win the World Series if they don't have Nolan Gorman reaching something close to his ceiling. You don't have anybody else in your lineup. We've talked about it for years. And I think it's uh, Jesse Rogers from ESPN that's mentioned this over the last few seasons. If you don't have a left-handed power bat in your lineup, you can't win the World Series. Can't do it. Every team that's been there that has made significant strides over the last few years, they've got a guy that profiles that way. A lot of the times, Kyle Schwarber, regardless of which team it's been on. <laughs> I think for the Cardinals, you have one guy that profiles as that. It's Nolan Gorman. I can't point to any other left-handed bat available to you that has the potential to hit 30 home runs this year. And I think for Gorman, the expectation is that he hits 30 home runs for you this year. So you have Jordan Walker. You've got... Uh, Arenado and Goldie and all of these different hit Contreras, they're all right-handed. They're all hitting for average and power potentially, but they're all hitting from the right side. If you don't have Nolan Gorman reaching his ceiling from the left side as a power bat, you have nobody else who can. So for me, that is why he is completely irreplaceable on this roster this season. The fifth most important player by my ranking, ninth on our list. T-Bone, where do you fall on Gorman? Yeah, I, I agree with what you said there to where he provides the best ceiling in terms of uh, he's got the best raw power on the team, just out of everybody, not, not just the left-handed bats. The reason I had him a little bit lower on my list where you mentioned I had him at seven, he probably would have been fifth for me if I knew what they were going to do with the lineup when we made the list because I felt like there was a chance they were going to put Newport in the three hole which I just totally disagree with, but I thought there was a chance they were going to do it. And if that's the case, where's Gorman hitting? You know, is he all the way? Because it's not going to be four. It's not going to be five. If it's all the way down in six, he loses some of his importance. Now, the way things are, he would be five for me because he's clearly going to be their three-hole hitter. And you're right. He provides the most pop for this team. You need that left-handed power. I... That's why I had him top 10. And if he were going to be the three-hole hitter, he would have been fifth for me on my list. Here are the left-handed power bats across the league. Matt Olson, Atlanta. Kyle Schwarber, Philly. The Dodgers with Shohei and Max Muncy, both of whom had at least 35 home runs a year ago. The Yankees have Juan Soto. The Rangers have Corey Seager. The Dodgers also have, by the way, Freddie Freeman, Kyle Tucker on the Houston Astros. Chicago's got Cody Bellinger. Arizona's got Co uh, Corbin Carroll. If you are a contender and you don't have one of these guys, and by the way, I didn't even mention Bryce Harper, who finished with 21 home runs last year because he only played 126 games. If you don't have one of these guys, you are not a real contender. You have to have somebody that fits into this kind of a role. The Cardinals have the potential to have it with Nolan Gorman. And if he doesn't reach his ceiling this year, everything else we're talking about with this lineup, it, it, it changes in terms of the ceiling for it. That is the guy that allows you to dream on the Cardinals having a top five offense in Major League Baseball this year. So the ceiling to me going into the season for Nolan Gorman, probably like a 260, 270 hitter. I don't think he's going to hit for a ton of average, but 40 home runs. 40 home runs is the kind of ceiling that we're talking about here. Like if he had a Max Muncy type of season or a 
Juan Soto. You know what? Corey Seager probably would be the type of season that you're talking about here with like 35 to 40 home runs. I think that's what you're talking about for for Nolan Gorman. What do you guys see as his ceiling going into this year? Yeah, I think your ceiling is the 35, 40 home run hitter. I think you're talking about a Kyle Schwarber esque impactful player, and you're talking about a major piece for this team when it comes to the the ability to be flexible with your batting order. And I I saw that they're talking about putting him in the middle of Goldschmidt and Arenado this upcoming season. Like, mm -hmm. that's massive. So, yeah, you're talking about 35 to 40 home runs for Nolan Gorman. Yeah, I think the ceiling is probably 40 home runs. And I, I think he can hit 260, 270, kind of like you said, because he hit for average in the minors. So I think he can do it. And I think is it then you bring up the on base a little bit as well. I think the ceiling is you have Kyle Schwarber 2.0, but hits for better average. Yeah. And doesn't get on base probably quite as much. Probably yeah, doesn't probably have not, the same batter side. This is one thing that I to. wanted to get to with you, T-Bone. You mentioned to us before the show today that you're seeing something a little different with Nolan Gorman in the spring. Last year in spring, it was the first time that we really noticed, oh, the defense is a little better. It looks a little different out there. It looks more comfortable at second base. And these are the kinds of things that I am interested in finding out from spring training. I don't look at the numbers like Paul Goldschmidt apparently isn't hitting in spring. I don't care. It doesn't matter to me. Cal Gibson has a 12 ERA in spring. I don't care. We know. What I'm Cal really Gibson worried is. about well, that one. Yeah, that one should be concerning. We know what he is. He's been in the league for <coughs> 25 years. He's 70 years old. He, we know what he is as a starter. It's not going to be great. He's working on stuff at spring training. It'll too. be better. The process stuff, Nolan Gorman looking more athletic in the field last year taking more walks this year, showing a little bit more patience. That, to me, is interesting. T-Bone, what are you seeing there? Uh, him seeing the seven walks is interesting. It shows me that the batter's eyes a little bit better and that he is now being more selective as a hitter. So I don't know. I wouldn't think that this would pull away. It's not going to pull from his power. But it will pull away from instead of 40 home runs, it's 30 home runs, and he gets on base a little bit more. Would you sign up for that? I would. I mean, if he's being more selective, that means it's less chasing. The strikeout rate's going to come down a little bit more. And if he's going to get to that ceiling that we talk about, it is a little bit of the batters. I, I mean, you mentioned that maybe he doesn't have the on base of Kyle Schwarber. Man, if, if what we're seeing in spring is actually true and the, the batter's eye is better, I mean, he's taking seven walks this spring and has Took a 417 on base. Well, it's going to be even higher after uh, the stats update. Then, guys, he could actually end up being potentially Kyle Schwarber. Like, Kyle Schwarber hits 40 home runs and gets on base, and I don't even care about the average for him. And if that's the case, then maybe you could potentially, potentially explore throwing him up towards the top of the order if you wanted to. And instead of going with a Donovan Newport or Donovan Goldie, you could go a Donovan Gorman 1-2 combo and have some serious thump in the top half of your lineup. Coming up next, where do you think that Robert Thomas belongs in the conversation of the top centers in the NHL right now? The Athletic put together their list. We all think they're a little lower than, on him than they should be. We'll talk about it next year on 101 ESPN. Alex Ferrario with you to talk about my friends over at Rhino Shield. You've heard me talk about what they've done to my house. So you're probably driving around, you're driving past different businesses, and you look at some of these businesses, and one, you'll see the ones that are worn down and look bad, paint chipping off, and you're thinking, man, that business has been around for 40-plus years. But then you drive past another business, and you see the fresh new paint, the coating on the side, a new roof, and you think, wow. That's brand new. Well, that's probably one of the customers of Rhino Shield and the changes that they make. Uh, Darren and his team do outstanding work for the exteriors of homes and businesses, and they've already been working on stuff for the 2024 year. Chesterfield Amphitheater, Cottleville Smiles, uh, Automotive in Kempen in House Springs. They built, they did the paint job for a complex right next to my house that looked old and worn down, and now it looks like it was just built. And that's the work that you get with Rhino Shield. It's a two to three 
factory coating process. It's got a lifetime warranty. And on top of it, you know that the work that they're doing is going to last the time for you at your home or business. Water damage, sunlight, UV rays, it's all taken care of with Rhino Shield. Give Darren a call today. Tell him Alex Ferrario sent you 877-25-RHINO or 877-25-RHINO.com. Alongside Alex Ferrario and Tanner Hendrickson, I'm Brandon Kiley. Which of these categories would you say that Robert Thomas belongs in? The Athletic put together their list of the top centers in the NHL earlier today, and I think they were a little low on where Robert Thomas fits in. So they went through and they put in, it's not necessarily like a ranking, but it essentially is. The best of the best centers. I don't think any of us are going to disagree with these, Alex. Nathan McKinnon, Austin Matthews, Connor McDavid. We can all agree that's more than fair. They should all be ranked above Robert Thomas, right? Agreed. Yeah. All right, continuing on from there. Guys that are cup guys. Essentially, they're players that have been the engines for their championship teams and still could do it if in the right situation. They've got Sidney Crosby in this category, Jack Eichel in this category, Braden Point in this category as well. All seem reasonable mm -hmm. to me. Continuing along, the spotlight awaits players who have already shown plenty and have even more to gain from a major playoff run if they're able to get there this spring. Alexander Barkov, Sebastian Ajo, Elias Pettersson, Rope Hintz, all of whom I think are more than reasonable to be in that category. They continue. See you next year. The young stars that are finding their way. Connor Bedard, Jack Hughes. Seems fair again. Continuing along, bubble guys on the fringe teams. They're probably a number one center man on a championship team. They might be a number two. Bo Horvat, Dylan Larkin, Mark Shifley, uh, and then Zabinijad. The next category I find to be interesting because this is where they have Robert Thomas. Guys that are solidifying their reputation. They categorize, the, categorize this as players who have either improved, returned to form, or followed up a previous breakout with a good season. Nick Suzuki, Robert Thomas, and Joel Erickson Eck are the three players that they have in this category. Alex, I don't think that Robert Thomas belongs in that group. No, I, I can understand why they put him in that group because they're talking about a breakout season after a season that he underperformed, and which he absolutely did. But Robert Thomas is night and day better than both of those players. Like Joel Erickson Eck on a Stanley Cup contending team is a number two centerman. Uh, Nick Suzuki on a Stanley Cup contending team is a number two centerman. Robert Thomas, if you put him on a team right now in the playoffs, you're putting him on a top line. Uh, he's one of only five centermen that have 50 or more assists this season. It's him, McKinnon, McDavid, 
uh, JT Miller and Leon Dreisaitl. Everyone else is under that. And when you look at his even strength uh, points four on the ice, he's top 20 among centermen in the National Hockey League. I think where he falls short is the defensive side of it, but he's still a plus eight with, I would say, a rotating cast of players that haven't been good defensively with him all season long. Robert Thomas, to me, should be in the same conversation as Alexander Barkov. Those are the two guys that I would say you look at him right now and you say, yeah, those are guys that could center a team on a Stanley Cup championship as the number one centerman. They just haven't gotten there yet. So the other conversation that is related to this, and Alex, we've been having this for most of the season, is what he has around him yep. in terms of the wingers, right? A lot of these guys that are legit number one centers, no doubt about it. You put it with a, you write them in pen, not pen or pencil. They've got somebody next to them that's going to score, you know, 30 to 40 goals every single season, whether it's Robert Thomas next to them or anybody else from this category yeah. next to them. Thomas doesn't necessarily have that guy right now. But as I was going through earlier today, Alex, I, th I think we've been a little hard on the Blues top line so far this season because I went through the other contenders in the Western Conference, Winnipeg, Colorado, Dallas, Vancouver, Vegas, and Edmonton. I think those are the other six teams that are legitimate contenders. Do you agree with that? Mm -hmm. The top line for each team, these are the wingers for their number one centerman, okay? As of right now, based on what their line combinations are currently. Winnipeg has Kyle Connor and Alex Iafolo. And that's because Gabe Velarde is hurt. But Gabe Velarde is up there when healthy. Even if it was Gabe Velarde? I would take that top line over your top line. I mean, Kyle Connor is a, a like consistent 35 to 40 goal scorer. And Gabe Velarde, we've talked about how incredible of a trade that was. I would take a Robert Thomas over a Mark Shifley because I think Thomas has more upside. But I think you have two guys on that team that are top line caliber players. You think Gabe Velarde is better than either Robert or, or either Buchnevich or Kyra? I think his injury problem right now is is the is the biggest factor. I would say he's the the third most important player in those top line players. I would say Kyle Connor is the. I'd argue the, the most important, but you always go the centerman. But, like, if you go a one, two, three punch, you, you talk about Thomas over a Shifley. I would say you take a Kyle Connor over either Kyrou or Buchnevich. I agree. Then I would take the Blues other I, winger over Gabe Velarde. And again, injury risks are the part that I can understand the argument with. But from what I've seen when Gabe Velarde is healthy, I think he's a better player. Interesting. Okay. Uh, Colorado, I, it, there's, yeah, there's no, no question. There's no Shushkin argument there. and Ranton, and that's just better than what you have to offer. Yeah. They have one of the top line. Like, you could make a pretty solid argument. That's it, the best top line. And Nachushkin is the third most important player. Like, you can rotate that one. But what you would have Ranton and McKinnon, it doesn't matter. On Dallas, you've got Jason Robertson and Joe Pavelski. I think that's a little better than what you have. I think that's comparable to what you have. The problem is you don't have the 40 goals in Jason Robertson. Because right. I think Pavelski and B Buchnevich are very similar players. Now it gets interesting to me, Alex. Vancouver's top line right now is Hoglander and Garland Yeah. next and to Pedersen. And, and where's Besser? Is Besser on the second Besser's line? Besser's on the second line. Yeah, that one I think they're... Like, when they were the, the best team in the Western Conference, Besser was up there. They've fallen victim to poor play as of late but yes i would your wingers are better yeah your wingers are better than them vancouver or excuse me vegas barbershev marcia so no marcia so is amazing yeah and stone's up there when he's not injured but i understand we're playing the game of right now and barbershev yeah i like, I would have Eichel and Marcheseau over a Thomas and a Kairu, but when you put Barbashev in there, I would rather have a Pavel Buchnevich. So that one's kind of like a 50-50 split for me. Edmonton, Nugent Hopkins, and Hyman. I think that's better than what you have. The reason why I wanted to talk about this, Alex, is because each of these teams, other than Colorado, seems to have one guy that's kind of a fringe top player. Yeah, you got a throw, not a throw-in guy, but you got a guy who can move around if you need him to. Alex, I follow... Garland, Hogland, Barbie, Nugent Hopkins. A lot of those guys are space clearing players. And so this gets back to our conversation that we've had a number of times of whether it's Jake Neighbors or somebody that profiles like Jake Neighbors, I don't think you're all that far away from having a legitimate top line. It's not going to be in the conversation with the Colorado Avalanche. No. And the way that the Blues are building, they're probably going to have to beat these teams with their second and third lines, which is where they're weak right now, and that's what makes it really, really difficult for you. But the reason why I wanted to bring this up as a conversation is because I think you can probably get by with one of Booch or Cairo on that top line if you are willing 
to have the other player up there be Jake Neighbors. And then whoever wasn't on that top line can be a second line player. Some of the teams that we've mentioned here have expensive second line players mm -hmm. that are just overqualified second liners for them. Brock Besser would be one of those players who's making like $6 million a year, I believe it is. You're missing the other guys in the middle six right now. Yeah. And that's what could put you over the top. And that's where guys like Snuggerud and Dvorsky and hopefully this offseason, maybe adding somebody else could come into play. But I just found it interesting as we go through and you actually compare them one to one to some of these other top contenders in the Western Conference. You fall short compared to some of them, no doubt about it. But it might not be quite as far off as what I previously would have anticipated. The way I would label it is I think you have two guys right now that are rotating pieces. Like, I think you've got two guys that are like Valerie Nachushkins or um, Brock Bessers, guys that can play up there for you but are probably better suited to play on the second line. It's kind of what Brandon Saad is. He can play on the second line for you, but he's better suited on the third line. And I'll go back to what Doug Armstrong told us when we talked with him a few months ago about Robert Thomas' season, and he said, my goal is to get a guy to get Robert Thomas to that 100-point level. And I, I think you I think you could potentially have it in a couple of years with a Snuggerud and Neighbors. I think that profiles as a top line in terms of your goal scorer and your power forward. I think right now is kind of the is kind of the placeholders to get to that point unless one of them take off. And look, last year, uh, there was no argument for me. Pavel Buchnevich was a number one line mate, but we've, we, we've seen the dip off a little bit there. Maybe some of that is just the trade speculation. Maybe he's injured. We don't know. I think the Cairo thing, we've entered the season every year and said, well, he could be a 40-goal scorer, and he almost got there, but you've seen a step back. I think you are still searching for that guy like Zach Hyman was with Connor McDavid, like Rope Hint, or, uh, Jason Robertson was for Rope Hintz. I think you're still searching for that guy to take Robert Thomas to that next level. Yeah, and, and I would argue, I think that that guy might actually be Jake Neighbors. And that's not because I think, I think Jake be. Neighbors is a 40-goal scorer, but I think that if you get somebody that can clear the front of the net for those other players, and I think it's probably Jordan Cairo most likely, I think you're going to start seeing some better results yeah. uh, because of that. I, I've made it, the, the line for me is Booch Thomas and Neighbors. I think that's the line combination of you've got your 200-foot player, your playmaker, and your net front presence. Yeah. I, I think that's something, if they lose tonight, it's something I would go to. You have to In consider the next it. game, I would have absolutely give that yeah. legitimate consideration especially for how much praise has been on jake neighbors not just after that last game but this season they're running out of excuses i agree point to not give him more ice time he's alex ferrario that's Tanner hendrickson and i'm brandon kiley blues versus the abs tonight pregame at six o'clock you'll see one of the top lines in the nhl right now on the abs going up against your top line it'll be fun to see that as a legitimate measuring stick for robert thomas to see where he's at right now coming up next we continue our breakdown of the ncaa tournament we will break down the next region for you here on 101 espn Alex Ferrario back with you to talk about my friends over at Classic Air Care who have been making people comfortable since 1926. And look, when it comes to purchasing an HVAC system, nobody wants to do it. It's like buying a car. You're thinking, great, now I got to go through the sales side of it and get up priced on everything, and it's going to be a disaster. That's why I love Classic Air Care. I've already had the conversations with them about purchasing a new HVAC system. Now I'm not there yet because they take incredible care of my 26 year old unit, but I know that when I get to purchase, purchasing an HVAC system. They're going to walk me through the whole process. They're going to tell me what I need, not what would be good for me. And I think that's great with Classic Air Care. Plus, they've got financing options, which is huge, especially when you're putting that much money towards a new HVAC system. The financing offers that they have is for $99 months, uh, for or $99 a month for a new HVAC system. It's 18 months, 0% financing. You can see all of the reviews that they have, a 4.8 rating up on Google Review, and find out why me and my family have been using Classic Air Care. Find out for all of your HVAC needs at ClassicAirCare.com.
Tara Hendricks, Deer Day Sports Center update brought to you by Saliga Heating and Cooling. The Blues back in action tonight as they host the Colorado Avalanche. Well, pregame coverage starting at 6 o'clock with Alex Ferrario and Joey Vitale. Then Joey will join Chris Kerber for puck drop at 7. Cardinals currently in game number one of their split squad doubleheader today as they're taking on the Miami Marlins. And they are trailing 8-7 to seven through five innings. And they'll take on the Mets later tonight. And Lance Lynn will get the start for the St. Louis Cardinals. This sports update is brought to you by Saliga Heating and calling an independent American Sander heating and air conditioning dealer. All right, let's get into our NCAA tournament regional breakdown. We continue with the West region, guys. I'm going to be honest this with you. This region sucks. I, I'm having a tough time feigning interest in this year's NCAA tournament. I'm going to watch it. I'm going to bet on it. We're going to have a great time. Oh, yeah. We're going out to O'Fallon. We're going out to... Cybergs. Cybergs. We're going no, out to Helen Fitzgerald. Fitzgerald. That's right. It's going to be a good time. Hype Cybergs. Good time to be had yeah. for all. All right, coming up, a rewind here on BK and Ferrari. Oh, do we already screw the timing up again? Well, T-Bone, we talked about this off air a little bit ago. Well, I don't know what you're talking about. I'm excited. I love it's March Madness. Buzz, but we're going to pretend like it is for Whoa, the next seven no minutes pretending. here on BK and Ferrari as we break this down guy. this West region. The number one seed in this region is the North Carolina Tar Heels. Number two seed in this region is the Arizona Wildcats. I have no interest in watching them play basketball. Baylor is the three seed, and Alabama, who doesn't play any defense, is the four seed. Good. All good, right. good, 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 good. Let's good. go through this the way that we did yesterday. We'll continue doing this each of the next two days with the final two regions as well. Maybe the game you're most looking it. forward to see in this region is what, Alex? Uh, mine's Nevada versus Dayton. And I, I, on my bracket that I filled out, I have Nevada upsetting Dayton mm. because I think that they're they're an inconsistent team, but I think they're a better team than a 10 seed. I think they should have been ranked a little bit higher. And frankly, I never buy into the Dayton Flyers, although when I never buy into them is when they typically make me regret it and tear up my uh, my bracket. So that's the one I find interesting. It's funny because I had that one as well because I really like that Nevada squad. I, I think- his favorite in that game, by the way. Yeah. <laughs> They're also a ten seed. Yeah, I... <laughs> uh, I, I so funny. I, I also to go a little bit different from Alex. I really do like that matchup. I, I like Charleston versus Alabama. Charleston likes to play fast. I wonder if they can kind of speed up this Alabama squad. Uh, I'm not going to give away my upset pick yet, but I really like this Charleston team. All right, I've got two other games that I'm focusing on that I find to be really interesting as well. I'll go North with Carolina, Carolina versus the play-in. No, not that one. <laughs> uh, New Mexico versus Clemson. Yep, that's a good one. New Mexico is sneaky, ladies and gentlemen. Richard Patino has them flying. Did you just call him Richard Patino? <laughs> It's Rick Patino, sir. No, it's Richard. Nope. It's actually Richard. It's his kid, Thank right? You, oh, it's his kid? Yep. He got fired from Minnesota. He sucked so I bad I didn't there. realize that. Yeah. Well, I stand corrected. Thank you, sir. Uh, so New Mexico is really interesting, and they play a really, really fast tempo. They've got a pretty good offense. They play great defense. That being said, in terms of being tested this year with their schedule, wasn't a whole lot of it. And when they were tested, more often than not, they failed to win those tests. With one exception, they did win the Mountain West Conference Tournament, and that required them to beat Colorado State, Boise State, and San Diego State en route to that championship. So they're playing their best basketball at the right time, classic type of conversation. And man, I kind of like you with Dayton, Alex, I don't buy Clemson. I absolutely do not buy this team. So that's the game that I'm most looking forward to in the first round. Clemson versus New Mexico. And that brings us to our next thing, which is a big upset. (laughs) I am going with Grand Canyon dude, over St. Mary's. I have three upsets in this division, and that's one of them. And I felt like an idiot when I put it, but I'm like, I don't buy into St. Mary's. This is interesting because I got St. Mary's in the Elite Eight. Do you? I love the – they're like a 3 and D type team, and I really love that. And I think that's going to play great in March. Now, granted, part of the reason I have them getting there is I have them meeting – uh, 13 seed in the second round, but I love the St. Mary's squad. I, I don't see them getting upset by Grand so Canyon. St. Mary's is very good, but when you have a 3 and D squad and you play as slow as they do, I always find those to be the types of games where you can allow the other team to stick in it, man. And Grand Canyon can shoot. Rand- Randy Bennett is going to play slow as molasses. 
He's one of the Bennett bros, and those teams we know, T-Bone, from Virginia's experiences in the NCAA tournament, they are always liable to lose earlier than you expect them to. When you play that slow, you keep the other team in it, and then suddenly there's a couple of plays down the stretch that allow them to be able to win. So I've got Grand Canyon upsetting yep. St. Mary's in the first round. So I have three different upsets. Grand Canyon was one of them. I have New Mexico beating Clemson, but the one that I'm going to hone in on is Nevada over Dayton. I said earlier, that's the that was the first upset that I looked at, and I said, I can see Nevada easily winning that one, and people being like, what the hell happened? Dayton, even though they're favored. <laughs> To be fair, New Mexico's favorite, I was going to say all of these are favored, probably. Uh, the one I like is I've been hitting at it, Charleston over Alabama. Charleston likes to play fast, and Alabama stinks defensively. I think the defense, and look, this is why I've been alarmed about this Illini basketball team in the East region. Man, if you don't play defense in March, you got to play perfect offensively. And if Charleston plays fast and they find a rhythm, I think they can hang around, and I think they could potentially upset Alabama in the first round. All right, let's continue with our sleeper pick to win the whole thing out of this division, out of this region, to, to come out of this region, represent it in the Final Four. If you look over at the odds, the favorite right now is Arizona, surprisingly enough, and then North Carolina, Baylor's third, and then Alabama. Alex, who's your sleeper to come out of the West? Mine's Baylor. It's the third it's the third team in that group. I have Baylor beating Arizona and then beating uh, I forgot who I had because I know North Carolina didn't get there, but I I think New they, Mexico, Baylor, Clemson. It, it might have been it might have been New Mexico because I had North Carolina losing before they got to that one. Baylor's got two guys that are NBA draft potentials, and I think when you have those stars and when you got a group that shoots, Ken Palm had them at like 14th, and they were the sixth best adjusted offensive yep. team. That's the team for me that I think you're going to look at it because a lot of people I've seen going the straight chalk route where it's first place, first place, first place. That's my third place team that gets actually to the final four yeah i don't know if they are, should be considered a sleeper or not but i have baylor as well i i've got them I, I love this baylor squad too. they shoot the ball well as you mentioned they got two guys who are going to get drafted don't play defense very well D defense is a bit of concern for them but they play a little bit better uh when they've got their big guy that's kind of roaming there in the middle so i i think they're the team that i really like that got slept on in this region a little bit all right well i'm going to go ahead and cross off baylor who i had for this uh michigan state is my sleeper team I, Never, hate I hate Michigan, Michigan State. State. I was listening to Matt Norlander and Gary Parrish last night. They despise that Michigan State's even in this tournament. So I agree with them. That being said, you never sleep on Tom Izzo. And this is his time of the year. If they are able to make it past Mississippi State, which I do not think is a guarantee. I think there's a real chance that they end up losing in the first round. And this is one of those things where like, okay, they're either asleep or they're gone. I think they have a chance to beat North Carolina in the second round of the NCAA tournament. And if they beat Carolina, man, I like their path to the Final Four potentially because I don't think Alabama is all that good this year. And I think Alabama would be the team that they see in the Sweet 16. They play zero defense. When they're on offensively, they look amazing. But they play no defense. So sure, yeah, Michigan State with Tom Izzo at the helm could absolutely beat them to go to the Elite Eight and then boom, you're one game away. So Michigan State's my sleeper team. I don't like that team this year. I don't like this region, though, so somebody's yeah. got to come out of it. Last thing here. Well, we got two more. Who's the team you're confused by, Alex? Uh, it's North Carolina. Because everything I've heard, North Carolina should not be in a one seed. They, like, I, I heard Parrish talking about how Iowa State should be a one seed over North Carolina. And North Carolina has a really good defense but offensively i don't think they're anything to get exciting about i have north carolina losing i just looked it up to grand canyon so i, I like it north carolina is just the one for me that i look at and i say i can i get purdue i get houston i get yukon but man i don't understand north carolina being a number one seed i i think mine it would be alabama and it's kind of why i have them going down in the first round because they play great offensively. Like, they could be a team that could end up being the one that meets North Carolina in the Sweet 16, get that 1-4 matchup. But, man, their lack of defense scares the crap out of me, and that's why I have them losing in the first round. They're the one that confuses me. I'm a little confused by Arizona as well, just because they've Let's scuffled. <laughs> they've scuffled a little bit down the stretch. Boom. I don't trust that team at all, man. I think Tommy Lloyd is a bad basketball coach, just a bad coach. Wow. And we have seen Shots Arizona fired. fail in the postseason in recent years with him at the helm. They play fast. They've got a good offense. I'm excited to see Caleb Love in the tournament again. I hope he has all the success in the world and native St. Louis and wish he was at Mizzou, but he made the absolute correct call in going to Arizona instead of Clearly. coming to Mizzou this year. <laughs> that being said, dude, I just don't trust this team at all. I remember sitting there last year, T-Bone, with you watching the games as Mizzou's on one screen, Arizona's on the other. And we were just waiting and waiting and waiting. We we're like, oh, Arizona's going to take care of this. They're going to take. 
It's never happened. Didn't they? Who they lost to Princeton, right? Who was it? Was I think it, it Princeton? was Princeton. Yep. And then and, Princeton beat Mizzou. Yeah. Well, we didn't have talked about that part. But Arizona was so nice. clearly <laughs> the superior team in that game, and they just let them stick around, let them stick around, let them stick around. I know this is a different Arizona team, but I can't get that taste out of my mouth. I've got them as the team that I'm confused by because they've got the talent to be able to go on a deep run, and they're in the region that could allow for it. I just don't believe in them, man. That's why I've got them losing to Baylor this year in this region. All right, who's the team you've got making it? I got Baylor. I got Baylor beating uh, whomever I had playing against them to get to the final four. Again, when you've got a top 10 pick, Jacoby Walter has been awesome this year. Plus, I love me a good six foot five shooter. Um, I, I think that star power and the coaching for Baylor carries them to the final four. So they're my team. I'm with Alex. I got the Baylor Bears. Roar. Come on, man. Give, give more. I, don't, I can't do it, but you need to do it. Give it a better roar. No. Damn it. But no. North Carolina, whatever, go talk. <laughs> I, Are you going to be Shannon Sharp and just straight four teams? Dude, that was amazing. Did you see what he did? <laughs> just straight four number one teams. The, the top four seeds from the, the men's side and the women's side. All number yeah. one. Getting to the final four. Someone handed Shannon Sharp before he we went on the air and said, Shannon, did you fill out your bracket? No. Okay, give it to me. One, it one, would, one. I'd We're be, good. It would be great if he picked every favorite. <laughs> All across the board. I tried that before. It didn't look good. Yeah, I would imagine that probably doesn't work out super well. Um, I, I've got North Carolina advancing. I just, like, I'm not I'm not trusting Baylor. Scott Drew, really? I'm going to do that? I'm not trusting Arizona. You really want me to do that with Tommy Lloyd again? At least Scott Drew. I'm not trusting time. Alabama yeah, say, because Drew's they don't play defense. It. I guess I'll go with North Carolina. Like, none, of, none of these teams. I, yeah, the West wanna, sucks. Somebody from your region. The Illinois region should be in this one. Iowa yeah, State. I would trust UConn, Auburn, Illinois, and Iowa State over any of these schmucks yeah. that are in the West region. So, listening, good luck. do yourself a favor and go listen to Gary Parish's podcast. Listen to that man yell at the top of his lungs why Michigan State got into the tournament and why Iowa State is ranked as the eighth or ninth best team in the tournament. It is a joke. Yeah, I, that that region, Illinois got absolutely screwed with the way that that Shaq, thing goes. The committee hates the Illini. Well, they just know they're this year, I think you got a better draw in the first and second round. Yeah, whatever. <laughs> Previously, you, you got screwed with one of those two matchups. This year, it's to get to the Elite Eight, man. Good, good luck. Good, good luck. luck. All right, coming up next, we'll put a bow on this thing. By the way, the NCAA tournament is here, and you can watch the games this Thursday and Friday with 101 ESPN and Bud Light. We're going to be out on Thursday live from Cybergs in O'Fallon, Illinois. Come on out and join us. We're watching the games during the show. The Fast Lane will be broadcasting from 2 to 6 out there as well. Then on Friday, you can join both shows as we uh, broadcast live from Helen Fitzgerald's out at Lindbergh. It's all presented by Bud Light. Full details at 101ESPN.com. The Rewind coming up next.
Alongside Alex and T-Bone on BK, the bracket is set. You can get signed up to play in this year's Bracket Madness Pick'em Challenge at 101ESPN.com. Free to enter. The top scores bringing home a grand prize of $250 Amazon gift card and a 101ESPN prize pack. You can get signed up to play in Bracket Madness at 101ESPN.com. It is brought to you by Bud Light and Twin Peaks. If you guys missed anything from today's show, be sure to check it out on the podcast page, 101ESPN.com, the free 101ESPN app, and, of course, on YouTube at youtube.com slash 101 ESPN. It is all brought to you by Dobbs Tire and Auto Centers. Alex, to finish out the show today, we'll open or we'll finish where we started, which is for those that aren't buying into the Blues, can tonight's game change it? You're going up against one of the top contenders in the Western Conference. You're going up against one of the best lines in the Western Conference. Is this enough, or do you think it's going to take more still for the Blues? I think it's going to take more. The way I look at this is I don't think you lose anything if you lose tonight. Even if you get blown out, you look at it and you say, yeah, well, they're the superior opponent, and you're not expected to be a Stanley Cup contender. And if you win this one, you're going to look at it as, okay, well, you're buying into what they're doing. I think if you keep it close, more people will start believing a little bit more. The problem is we know what the narrative of this game is going to be. If you win it or if it's close, it's because of your goaltending, and people are still going to be skeptical of their offense, of their depth of scoring, of how they play defensively. But I don't see I don't see a losing scenario here for the Blues tonight. It's the next three games you have to make sure you come out on top. Otherwise, the skeptics will be right back and stay on board. T-Bone, you are one of these skeptics. So what would it take for you to get on board? Not of them as, of a, as a Stanley <laughs> Cup contender, but for them, for you to buy into them as a legitimate playoff contender i, I think you got to be competitive tonight it's not a win loss for me really i colorado is just a better team we mm -hmm. all we can all admit that it, it's then going at ottawa at minnesota home against vegas home against calgary those four games you've got to play well and you've got to come out i don't i wouldn't say you have to win all four but you got to come out with points especially against that one against ottawa and i would say probably the three those three yeah. minnesota vegas calgary are must win you got to get points in ottawa they can no longer have a well we didn't have our legs in the first period you know we had to travel travel oh, yeah. oh so tiring anymore you can't use it now it's the home stretch it's playoff time these it's this is the Blues playoffs, it starts now. Well, that was a hype video right there, T-Bone. For Thank somebody you. being a skeptic, you sound like you're on board of this well, I know train. how to make a hype video. And the next week, you have two must-wins. It's Minnesota and Vegas. So yeah. those are the two teams that you're competing directly with for a playoff spot. You have to win those two games. Yeah. The two games that are coming up tonight and on Thursday against Colorado and Ottawa, it's not must-wins. I'd like to see them be competitive. This is the one that means the least. Yeah. Because this is the game that nobody expects you to win. Benner and Nett, hopefully he can stand on his head. You find a way to get away with at least a point here. But this isn't going to determine anything for me. And in fact, even if they lose 5 to nothing, it's not going to say anything to me. Yeah. Ottawa's the game. Ottawa's the game that we have seen them fail in. They go on the road, coming off of a long home stand. They're playing really well. Let's see what that game looks like. Tonight is found money, man. If you find a way to win this one, all right, now yeah. we're really talking. But... Ottawa, Minnesota, Vegas, that's where the season is going to be determined for me. For Alex Ferrario and Tanner Hendrickson, I'm Brandon Kylie. You'll hear from Alex coming up at 6 o'clock for pre-game pre between the Blues and the Avs. We'll see if he's wearing the same suit at that point that he is right now. Coming up next, you got the fast lane here on 101 ESPN.